I hope we're feeling energized and ready for a great session this afternoon. Please take your seats. Please make sure to come forward. There are plenty of seats here next to the stage. I hope you took time to enjoy the lunch break, to visit the booths. The booths, by the way, were designed by a student from the Architecture School of UM6P. I thought they were really beautiful. There are so many exhibitions, by the way, going on on campus right now. Hope you will get the opportunity to visit those. Please take your seats. Please make your sure to inform your friends and tell them that we're kicking off this uh, afternoon. We don't want you to miss out on any of the amazing conversations happening. Again, this is a really unique opportunity for us all to interact and to hear from pioneering scientists, researchers. So let's make the most out of it. This morning, we were privileged to hear from President Labti, from Dr. Larwi. We heard, you heard, all the amazing incentives that were presented by SED. I'm just saying, each time you attend this session, you get points that will allow you to be on the top of performers of the students. So each morning we will celebrate the top performers. Um, this afternoon, then we started with the mindset, which was our first topic. Amazing, amazing talk by Dr. Dennett. And this afternoon, we're moving on to material transition and we're diving into crystal engineering. We will learn about how crystals will save the world. I'm definitely looking forward to that. Our next speaker is an internationally authority in his field, ladies and gentlemen. He has been ranked among the world's most cited researchers in the field of metal organic matter. He will be introduced by a brilliant PhD student. So let's welcome them both on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Mike Zaborotko and Mr. Ashraf Delhali. We'll hear first about your talk, then we'll open it up to the audience. Ashraf, take it away. Thank you, Manad. Thank you for your kind words and nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, as we delve into the realm of transition today, it's my, priv it's my privilege to introduce Professor Michael Zaurotko, whose work in crystal engineering not only showcases the transition from fundamental bench results to advanced prototyping, but also illustrates how crystal materials hold the key to transformative solutions for a myriad of global challenges. Professor Michael Zaurotko received his PhD degree from Imperial College, where he, where, he, where he published his first paper with the Nobel laureate Professor Jeffrey Wilkinson. Now, he serves as the Bernal Chair of Crystal Engineering at the University of Limerick in Ireland, but previously he joined many faculty positions at St. Mary's University in Canada, University of Winnipeg, and at the University of South Florida at the USA. His research is focused on the synthesis and the application of metal organic materials, known also as metal organic frameworks or MOFs, especially micropores and ultramicropores physisorbents, but he also works on pharmaceutical materials such as co-crystals. Professor Zaurotko currently enjoys an niche index of 115 and more than 60,000 citations. In 2011, Thomson Reuters listed him as the 20th highest impact chemist since 2000. And in 2014, 15, 16, and 18, he was listed among the highly cited researchers in the field of chemistry. Also in 2018, he was also cited as a highly cited researcher in a second field, which is pharmacology and toxicology. And in 2019, he was listed as a highly cited researcher across fields. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Learned Society of Wales, the Institute of Chemistry of Ireland. He is also a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Professor Zaurotko, 
it's an honor for me to introduce you today. We are so glad you could be here to share your insights on how and why the materials will save the world. Without further ado, please, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Ashka. Uh, it's my honor to be here. I've already tweeted. Uh, I'm old-fashioned, but I tweeted how spectacular uh, this campus is. Uh, and I realized it wasn't a big enough word, and now I know which one to use. Manal says amazing all the time, and I think that would be a better description uh, of this room and this campus, and hopefully the future of UM6P. Uh, okay, let's see if I have control. Yes, I do. Uh, I like to walk around, so I hate to let the camera guy know you're going to have to <laughs> uh, pay attention to what I'm doing this afternoon. Uh, it's a little bit ironic. This is my first visit to Morocco. I'm going to make one comment about AI. Uh, these days, when, you, when somebody leaves you a voicemail message, you get it translated into words. But my last name doesn't fit well with AI. Uh, there are only three in the world, <laughs> so I'm a one in three billion, and AI didn't quite pick it up, so it called me Mike Morocco. So I've got it on my text messages. Uh, so maybe it did predict something, though. Uh, so what I'd like to do is talk about crystals, uh, certain types of crystals, and why they are important today and in the future. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit unusually with my conclusion uh, because I think it's quite profound and important and points the way for where we must go. Uh, and my message is quite optimistic, uh, but there are some caveats. Uh, the reason I'm starting with my conclusion is that I received an email a few months ago, uh, a lay person, a person in the general public, who was concerned about CO2. Uh, so one of my uh, interviews online, it was related to COP26, when I talked about carbon capture and potential solutions for carbon capture. And he said in a few words what I have trouble saying in one hour. So I'm going to give you his words, uh, and then we'll get to the punchline. So he contacted me, uh, said I'm not a scientist, I have no formal training in chemistry, although he took college organic chemistry and flunked it. By the way, I didn't do so well in organic. I don't work in organic, so we have a lot in common there. Uh, he didn't expect me to respond, but I was sitting there preparing for my lecture the next day, and I included his comments in my lecture. He expressed to me a concern that Essentially, everything we're doing to address climate change is underwhelming. Uh, he didn't think electric cars were going to save the world or even solar powers were going to save, solar panels were going to save the world. They already would have. Uh, and essentially, he was sending out a message crying out for help. Then he concluded with this final sentence. That said, I discovered this thing called metal organic frameworks. So in a nutshell, this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, metal organic frameworks, why they offer exciting potential to disruptively change the future in a good way. Uh, and I'm even going to conclude with what that good way is, because there's only, to me, one end game on sustainability, and that is that air has to be the primary resource, not hydrocarbons, not petroleum, not natural gas, that ultimately all of our fills and all of our foods uh, will come from air. Uh, specifically, uh, CO2 uh, will not be an impurity in air, it will be a commodity in air that we will convert into carbohydrates. Nitrogen, already is a commodity, and it's converted into ammonia by the Bon Harbor process, uh, but we need to find better ways to do that because of the large energy footprint. Uh, water and O2 are also components of air, and they're also commodities that can be converted into energy 
fill type products. Uh, and there's a lot of research going on, but it's siloed in these areas. When all of these things come together, then the future will be amazing because these commodities can produce us pure water anywhere on the planet, on demand, even under the driest of conditions. They can produce food from air because plants come from CO2 and water and sunlight. Uh, they'll be able to produce fill from air, uh, alcohols, for example, and chemicals, which will be the basis of polymers and high-value products such as pharmaceuticals. Uh, this is, of course, what nature does. Uh, we just don't have a, an efficient way to do that today. So that's, at some point, going to happen. It has to, because it's the only way we can get full sustainability. It also happens to address things like CO2 in the atmosphere, because you now use it, you utilize it, instead of just capturing it and storing it. Uh, and of course, the movies have already shown us that future. Uh, on the right, uh, the movie Dune is relatively recent. Uh, Dune is a, a sci-fi novel that was published in 1965, when I read when I was 11 or 12 years of age. Uh, and it, I, it still impacts me to this day. And what is Dune about? Uh, well, it's a complex story set on a planet where there's no rain and no water, but you have to capture it from the atmosphere to survive. So, science fiction now, science fact in the not too distant future. Now, I will add the caveats now. Uh, there's science still to be done. There's technology development that needs to be done. There's also political decisions that have to be made and industry has to want to go after these new technologies that will displace the existing energy intensive technologies. The last two might be the most difficult. Uh, without cooperation across countries and with industry getting engaged fully, uh, the chances of success go down. So let's talk a little bit about my personal history. Um, I'm a chemist. Uh, I morphed into a crystal engineer. But when did I morph into the applications of crystal engineering? And it was mid-career. Uh, in 2007, I made my first trip to Africa. And to give you a clue as to where it was, if you don't recognize it, I took that photograph. It's on the southern tip of Africa. Uh, this is the Cape of Good Hope, and you have the Indian Ocean on the left and the Atlantic Ocean on the right. What I hadn't paid attention to until that point in time is that there were places around the world that were monitoring CO2, and the little building that's on the top of the mountain on the Cape of Good Hope is one of those places where they monitor CO2. Uh, there's no pollution there, no industry, and there's thousands of miles of ocean uh, in three directions. So it was one of the 10 or so locations in the world at that time where CO2 levels were being monitored. And I'm like, this does not look good. Uh, on the other hand, hey, we've got generations to sort it out, right? It's a steady, slow increase in CO2 levels, maybe not by geological time scale, but by a human time scale. Okay, that was then, uh, this is now. Uh, if you look carefully at this plot, what you'll see is that it's actually inflecting upwards. And if you actually look at five or 10 year increments, then what you'll see is that in the 60s, we were going up at about one PPM per year. In the 90s, 1.5 PPM. When I visited South Africa, around 2 ppm per year, but suddenly in the last seven or eight years, we've gone up 20 ppm since 2015. So we're actually going up now closer to 3 ppm per year. So not only are we not reducing CO2 emissions, at least what's in the atmosphere is going up. 
The effects of this are crystal clear. Um, they correlate with global air temperatures, which in 2023 set a new record, and not just a new record, but by a larger jump over the previous record than had ever been seen before. Um, the effects on the ocean are also, oceans are also crystal clear. We have a problem with global ocean temperatures. And 2024 started off really badly. We're now up to six sigma above the mean. Uh, there's no chance that this is just random uh, deviations. Uh, there is significant warming of the oceans occurring. There's also significant acidification of the oceans. And the blue line is the pH of the ocean. The pH is going down by measurable quantities every year. Uh, so to cut the long story short, it's no longer I'm curious and motivated, I'm scared. Uh, I have to say I'm now driven by the fact that we are facing no longer climate change, we're focusing a climate crisis or climate emergency. And then 2023 came. I always had the back of my mind, well, if the worst happens, I'll retire in Hawaii. And actually, I go to Hawaii every year, and I was in Maui in May of this year. Uh, this is off the coast of uh, Lahaina. Guess what happened in August of this year? I don't know if it made international news, but it shocked me that a tropical paradise with palm trees would have a wildfire that killed 100 people and burnt down 150-year-old buildings in what was once the capital of Hawaii. So another part of me said, let's go to Nova Scotia. I lived in Nova Scotia. It's always damp and wet in Nova Scotia, but a bit like Ireland. Guess what happened in 2023 in Canada? Uh, not just the West Coast, but also the East Coast and above the Arctic Circle, there were wildfires that were extremely damaging and destructive. So clearly we have ourselves a crisis. And this, it's too late to start planning, we need to do stuff. No talk, action. So that brings me to the crystals. Uh, a little bit of background about crystals. Where does the word come from? Uh, it turns out that it's a Greek word. Uh, it was the Greek word for quartz. Uh, they consider it a hard type of ice. Um, and uh, a very famous scientist Pasteur uh, also studied crystals and in 1848 uh, this painting is at the Musée d'Orsay. It's a realist room in amongst all the impressionists and it's uh, Pasteur studying the crystals that started the field of stereochemistry and stereochemistry is molecules which are left-handed and right-handed. So this started through study of crystals, and it's a lesser known but still hugely important contribution that Pasteur made. Making crystals is pretty routine. Uh, the most common approach is to dissolve a solid into a liquid to make a solution, find a way to supersaturate it by a chemical reaction or heating, evaporation or cooling, and then out pops a crystal. Uh, by the way, the official definition of crystal is a regular repeating array of atoms, molecules, or ions that extends in 3D. And if you're a crystallographer, as evidenced by sharp lines and an X-ray diffraction pattern. Uh, growing these crystals is something that is done in schools. There are manuals on how to grow crystals. There's not a big difference between what we do in the lab in research and what a primary student would do in a growing crystal competition. These were the happy winners of our Irish National Crystal Growing Competition in 2016. Uh, crystals are also in biology. Uh, if you magnify the wings of a peacock butterfly and go down up 
down in, in scale. Eventually you get to the image of the wing, which is a crystal of a substance called chitin, which is the same substance that forms the exoskeletons of shellfish and beetles. Last on the basics, I do have to say I love one crystal above all else, it's chocolate. Uh, chocolate is a crystal of cocoa butter with a very interesting active ingredient. It's theobromine. Theobromine makes you feel good. Uh, it's one methyl group different from caffeine, uh, which is a stimulant. Uh, caffeine uh, uh, is actually quite toxic if you take too much of it. Theobromine uh, it's not good for dogs, but I think it makes people feel well. Uh, theobromine, if you're a chemist, or even if you're a non-chemist, you might say, where's the bromine in theobromine? Well, theo is the Greek word for God, bromus is the Greek word for oats or food. So th theobromine is literally food of the gods, is the name that this molecule was given. And so, yes, not only do I love all crystals, is there anybody who doesn't love crystals, right? There might be one or two people who don't like chocolate. I, I met one once in my life who didn't like chocolate, but crystals, everybody loves crystals. Well, I don't like diamonds so much. I've spent too much money on diamonds over the years. But I do love these other two types of crystals. Uh, and these are award-winning photos, by the way. Uh, in the middle, we have Starship Enterprise which is a crystal, of a polymorph of a drug molecule growing on a different polymorph of a drug molecule. So this is showing a phase conversion of one crystal to another interrupted in real time because it was slow. Uh, the picture on the right was uh, from my group, uh, Shichang Wang, which won a prize at the British Association of Crystal Growth. He called it skyscrapers. It does look like Hong Kong a bit, doesn't it? Uh, these are needle crystals of a metal organic framework. Uh, so these are the crystals that I research in. Uh, so I especially love those crystals also. Uh, but here's the conundrum. We can't design a crystal the way we design a molecule. Uh, a crystal is what it wants to be. Uh, we have no ability to control it that's sort of where the idea of crystal engineering comes in. Uh, and the dream of crystal engineering dates back to uh, a Nobel laureate, Richard Feynman. And I, I can't say X, I have to say Twitter. Uh, he has a Twitter site and people tweet his comments still and he has well over a million followers. Uh, his fame is that he is regarded as the father of nanoscience and nanotechnology. And his most famous quote is, there's plenty of room at the bottom. Uh, he gave a series of lectures, they're published, you can look them up. He thought chemists were like magicians because he didn't fully understand the, the mindset, the siloing of chemists, but he had some very profound comments about materials. He asked this question, what would the properties of materials be if we could really arrange the atoms the way we want them? And he had an answer that was extremely profound and motivated me when I was a young assistant professor many decades ago to study crystal design. Because what he said was, not only will we get a greater range of possible properties that substances can have, he also said we'll be able to do different things that we can't do at the moment. That's exactly the challenge that we need to address with respect to the big picture that I started with. Uh, today, the field of crystal engineering has grown significantly. Uh, it's the field of chemistry that no longer just studies the design of crystals, it also studies the properties and applications of crystals. Now for 30 years or so, there was really little progress. Um, in fact, crystal engineering was an oxymoron. You couldn't design a crystal. You just collected the data 
and analyzed the structure, but you didn't pre-plan it. In 1988, the editor of Nature at the time uh, called it a scandal that in the physical sciences, we can't predict the structure of even simplest crystalline solids from a knowledge of their chemical composition. Uh, that was published in September 1988. But the way this statement is, means that you can patent crystals because the editor of Nature said they're unpredictable. They can't be expected. Uh, and means we have a huge industry around patenting and fighting over patents on crystal forms of pharmaceuticals. But that's a different story for a different day. Also in 1988, almost simultaneously, was published a paper which I would regard as Crystal Engineering 101. Uh, a crystal which had a structure which is precisely predictable from the molecular structure. And without getting too much into the chemistry, uh, it's a tetrahedral molecule uh, with four carboxylic acids. So it builds a diamond-like structure. Diamond is based upon tetrahedra. The, the official word is, is DIA in our, in our jargon, or diamondoid. Uh, this structure also exhibited something called interpenetration. There's a big empty hole in that structure and it's filled by the other structures. Now we take, treat this routinely, but this was groundbreaking at the time. And the glue, once again, that was holding this together was the oldest and best studied of all non-covalent bonds, which is the carboxylic acid dimer. Uh, a few years later, a chemist, Jim Wiest in Canada, uh, reported on the concept of tectons, but you could design new molecules with similar features to build diamondoid structures. And just a couple of years later, I'm calling this Crystal Engineering 102, uh, Richard Robson from Australia introduced the concept of node and linker. Now, I wish this were a tiling pattern as exotic as the ones that you see in Arab countries. It's not, though. It's the simplest of all tiling patterns, right? Uh, square tiles linked together. Uh, but simple is good when it comes to chemistry and, and even properties. So this is a by design network called a coordination network because the bonds that hold it together are metal organic, hence the term metal organic framework. Uh, and the concept is very straightforward. It's like Lego. You have your building blocks. There are two building blocks. There's a node. In this case, well, any node must have three or more connections. This has four connections, and it's a square. So hence, you end up with the square structure. Uh, the linker is anything that connects two nodes. Uh, so when you combine them, you end up with empty space. Uh, and in this case, it's what leads to porous materials. Uh, and it's, it's just coincidence, but the pore in this case is one nanometer, exactly one nanometer, plus or minus 0.1. So this is Crystal Engineering 102. Uh, everything took off at that point because these structures are highly modular. Uh, by that, I mean you can mix and match the components. Uh, you can have one node and two linkers and change one linker, keep the other, make new linkers all together. So they're highly modular. The, the uh, properties get affected strongly. There are now, uh, well, actually well over 120,000 of these structures that we have crystals for. Uh, and m the largest number one most common linker is the one that was used in this original 1990 paper. So how do we go from design of these structures to saving the world? And what areas can crystals impact the future positively? Well, there are four UN SDGs where new crystals with better properties can have a profound impact. 
better and cheaper medicines, more efficient solar energy harvesting, uh, air pollution, including industrial pollution and carbon capture, and clean water for all. All four of these areas need new, better materials, or secret sources, as I like to call them, to make more energy efficient, cost-effective processes moving forward. And things went nicely until finally in 1999 there were two major breakthroughs. Uh, one reported in Science, that's the compound on the left. We just call it HCUST1. Uh, and the other on the right is called MOF5, MOF for Metal Organic Framework. And what these compounds showed is something way beyond anything that had been seen before. In other words, they do different things, which is what Feynman had predicted. Specifically, they had ultra-large surface area of 1,900 and 3,000 meters squared per gram. Uh, to put that in a bit of perspective, uh, you know, we lo empty space is useful because you can trap things in it and release them in a controlled fashion. And what does 3,000 meters squared per gram mean? Well, a dime, a US dime, would be about 17,000 meters squared. And I'm afraid rugby football is my game. Uh, Ireland is number two or three in the world in rugby and beat France <laughs> big time a few weeks ago. Uh, this is the Irish National Rugby Stadium. The surface area of the field is 6,500 meters squared. So, so this is unprecedented and doing different things. But there's one slight problem. Surface area alone is more of a parameter than a property. It doesn't tell you if you can capture CO2 or conduct catalytic processes or capture drugs and release drugs in a controlled manner. Also, the parent compounds are not that stable to moisture. So for that reason, everybody thinks all MOFs are unstable. But that's not true. Some are. Some aren't. Uh, now, when it comes to the processes, um, this will be my absorption 101 slide. The main challenges in terms of separations are capturing trace impurities in gas mixtures, uh, vapor, gas vapor mixtures. A lot of energy is used up to do that, to purify commodities and to capture CO2 and to capture water, purify water. The problem is breaking up molecules of similar volatility, in some cases similar chemical properties and features, is hard to do. Uh, and there are two options. Uh, Fizz's option, uh, which uses weaker forces, they're non-covalent interactions between the target and the sorbent, uh, have some advantages. They're easily recyclable because they don't use much energy. They're typically fast. Uh, but the energies involved, most non-covalent bonds are 5 to 30 kilojoules per mole, means that the selectivity is quite low. Chemisorption flips it around the other way. Uh, chemisorption uh, has high selectivity because the energies are quite high. But that makes them harder to recycle and typically slow because the lower the concentration of the impurity, the lower the reaction rate. So you're actually doing a reaction. What we need is something right in the middle, uh, the donut hole. Uh, the donut hole is kind of halfway in between a typical physisorbent and a typical chemisorbent. Uh, that is, you need interactions on the order of 45 to 60 kilojoules per mole, and that will capture trace impurities at room temperature, spontaneously, act as a sponge. Uh, in addition, it has to be selective, so it can't capture everything, it has to capture just the target you're interested in. Now, 10 years ago, there was no material that could do direct air capture of CO2 because we didn't have anything in that donut hole. Fortunately for me uh, and for one of the professors at uh, UM6P, uh, Yusuf 
Belmab Kut, whose name is harder to say than mine, at least to me, um, uh, and uh, my former colleague, Mohammed Adoudi, who's obviously, I think you'll know that that's a Moroccan name also, uh, published an interesting, important paper in science, which was the first material that ever had the right properties to capture, spontaneously capture CO2 from the air. Uh, why did it do that? It's because it had a selectivity of greater than 2,500. And the ratio of N2 to CO2 is about 2,000 to 1. So, so you need to be at least what the ratio is of the components. Uh, by the way, the previous world record was only 200. Uh, now, the Generation 2 materials are up to 25,000. So we have materials that can spontaneously capture CO2 from air. Uh, three years later, we did the same thing for acetylene and ethylene, which is a key step in the world's largest industrial process, which is produ production of ethylene. Uh, almost looks like a three-year cycle in 2019. Uh, we discovered a material which could capture ethane in the present of ethene. And most recently, another three years later, uh, we were shown that we had a material that could capture benzene from humid air when benzene was even as low a concentration as 10 ppm and reduce it to 1 ppb. Uh, what is the key to all of these structures and these properties? Well, first of all, is that we collaborated. Uh, the skill sets you need, which include modeling, structural analysis, synthesis, uh, property characterization, rarely belong in one group. As I mentioned on the first paper, it was Mohammed Adoudi, and Youssef uh, was in his group uh, as a postdoc at the time, and his co-first author of the paper. And then Banglin Chen, Kaijia Chen, and Jian Rong Li, we worked with on these other materials. Uh, the punchline here is a lot has changed. Suddenly we can do those impossible separations with these low energy materials for the first time. Also, at this point in time, modeling advanced. So I would call this Crystal Engineering 301. Uh, modeling initially gave us insight but more and more, it's becoming predictable. Uh, this was a hypothetical experiment that was never published, but we conducted with Brian Space and Tony Pham in 2008. And it was on, at that time, hydrogen storage was the big deal. It was to study how to trap hydrogen. This was before we had these narrow pore materials, by the way, that work so well for the commodities. And what they showed is, to cut a long story short, pore size really, really, really matters. It looks obvious in hindsight, but what you want is to have a match, a match between the target and the pore walls. In other words, binding sites, just as in nature, just as in enzymes in nature. Once we create these binding sites, and there's a high density of them, we can do things that couldn't be done before. Ah, but I still have to be cautiously optimistic because I've told you what happens with binary mixtures. The real world is non-binary, like it or not. Uh, the real world is much more complex. Uh, in the real world, the gas mixtures of main interest, I've already mentioned the hydrocarbons, Collectively, these use up two or three percent of the world's energy because these are the highest volume products of the chemical industry and they need to be purified. Flue gas is another target for separations. Uh, and air, as I've mentioned. So these are, uh, we're, we're one step on a journey which needs multiple more steps to be addressed before we can say we've solved the problem. Uh, I've already made clear, I think air is the one that we need to go for because there's a real long-term goal when it comes to air purification. We want it anyway, but it's also a source of commodities and future chemicals. Uh, and it's also the hardest challenge. 
So if you can solve the hardest challenge, then the other ones should be able to fall into place. So I'll conclude with a short case study, uh, which is about atmospheric water harvesting. Uh, this is a, 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 a diagram that was taken from a science advances paper in 2016. Uh, it points out uh, parts of the world where there is water scarcity and how many months per year there is water scarcity. And what's scary is that you know, the most populated countries in the world are in the red zone. Uh, Morocco, of course, is there. Uh, and even then, prospects were getting grimmer because climate change has led to drier, hotter temperatures. Uh, it would be nice to think that we can just be more efficient in household use of water, but no, that's not the where we're going to solve the problem. Domestic use of water is only 8%. Uh, agriculture is where 70% of the water gets used up. And clearly, we're not going to stop agricultural activities. So where do we go? Well, atmospheric water, if you can handle it, uh, capture it in an efficient manner and release it in an efficient manner, is obviously the place to go. It might only be a small percent of the total water available. It's only 0.04% of the water on the planet. But it's still a lot of water, 10 to the 16 liters, which is an awful lot of volume. It's also renewable, because if you take it out from the air, more evaporates from lakes, rivers, and oceans. And there already are materials which are perfectly good at capturing water, even under the driest of conditions. Uh, they're called desiccants, and, and zeolites are the best known examples of desiccants. Some of them natural, some of them synthetic. So we have ourselves, ah, ha, ha. is that, a, is that a, a message that I should be finishing? Maybe me walking around wasn't such a good idea after all. <laughs> ah, there we go. So a few years ago, we set up a project that we called Aquasorb. The goal was to develop what we call regeneration optimized sorbents. That is, they perform well even under the driest conditions. They have high working capacity. Uh, they have low energy and fast recycling. And for that, we knew what we were looking for. It was a type of measurement called an isotherm, which is a step. Instead of a curve, it's a step. And when you have a stepped isotherm at low humidity, such as the green line in the middle graph, uh, technically it's a type 5 isotherm, but uh, uh, it's a special type of isotherm when it appears at such low RH. You're off to the races. And it turns out there are dozens of materials out of hundreds of thousands that are known to have this type of isotherm. So without being biased, uh, we looked at all of the obvious candidates uh, through collaboration with a company called Molecule. And we underwent a three-stage screening process. There's nothing too creative about this. This is technical. Somebody's going to do it. And we had the tools and we had the personnel. And so we simply screened 80 potential desiccants and ended up at the end of this three-step process with three candidates. Uh, we also studied composites of these desiccants. We also scaled them up. So we went to TRL 3.4. And then uh, we collaborated not we collaborated, Molecule took over and contracted out manufacturing of paper composites of these sorbents. And the end result of this, well, I guess if I walk around, it'll eventually click forward. Where should I be pointing? <laughs> 
There we go. It looks like it, it's when I'm here it works. Yeah. So I've just discovered something by screening. Uh, when you look at the papers that we made, they're 50% by weight absorbent, 50% cellulose. When you look at the papers and image the papers, it's obvious why they work so well. And that is the particles of the sorbent are fully exposed to the outside world. So they work fast and they're not affected by clumping, which is a serious problem in solid uh, sorbents. And one of them is a moth, that was the blue one. One of them is a Prussian blue, uh, that is the, uh, the middle one, Ross 38. And the other is what's called an azolate. Uh, and so there were three very different compounds chemically, but they ended up with the optimal properties and the scale up. In addition to that, I have some very sharp people in my group, especially these two guys, Andre and Dan, who unraveled how kinetics should be evaluated and studied and told us something very important about how these translate into the real world. Most of the time when people publish uh, on, on sorbent cycling, they show loading, full loading, full unloading, and cycle it, maybe hundreds of times. What Andre and Dan figured out is that the kinetics are in your favor if you partially load and partially unload. So instead of slower cycles with full loading and full unloading, the kinetics is in your favor if you do partial cycles. And you can do more of them, and you end up with optimal performance parameters that remarkably were pointing towards five-minute cycles. Five minutes of loading, five minutes of unloading. Uh, getting three or four times more water produced than if you go to the full loading, full unloading situation. And the end result of this, after just two years of research, was a machine. It's called Watco. Uh, around 20 of them were manufactured, and some of them are being tested in the field right now. Uh, that's beyond my pay grade, because uh, that's too high a TRL for my liking. Uh, the principle here, by the way, is exactly the same as the largest process around, which is dehumidification, industrial dehumidification. It's based upon something called the Munter's desiccant rotor. And the Munter's desiccant rotor is how large-scale dehumidification is done today, but it's highly energy cost, costly. We can also do the same thing for CO2 uh, and develop heat maps and get similar answers with roughly five minutes or so loading and unloading cycles. Uh, and these materials can re remove CO2 at 400 ppm on columns also. So to conclude, no, I don't mean think differently. I'm sorry to bring this word to you. I mean think supramolecularly. Uh, everything that works here works because of the supramolecular chemistry, uh, because the interactions between the host and the guest are just right. Uh, that's called supramolecular chemistry. Uh, have we solved the big problem? No. Uh, so we shouldn't get too carried away. I'm not a superhero. Uh, that's my normal, I dressed up for you guys, that's my normal conference attire. My students made a statue of me uh, when they went back to China. It's, it's an application of 3D printers that I didn't know about. Uh, so let's not forget, great performance, the best performance ever, is not the same as solving the problem. In fact, there are multiple other factors that have to be addressed before you decide whether it's feasible and which material should be selected. I will make a prediction about the future. China will probably, is already leading in this area. Ah, I'm not a fan of bibliometrics, but they're telling, they're telling us something here. Uh, the the right-hand graph is from The Guardian a couple of months ago. Uh, the number of papers on material science from China, it continues to shoot up and is approaching 50% of all in the world. 
and the US has gone down from 15 to around 11. If you look at university outputs, what this graph is showing is how Oxford and Cambridge are relative to Nankai University and Tianjin University in, in, uh, in China. They're two of the universities I visit in China. And right now today, Nankai just overtook Oxford and Cambridge in terms of field-weighted citation impact. Uh, I forgot to mention chemistry of people. Uh, my group is diverse. I'm very proud of how culturally diverse and gender diverse we are. Uh, this was our annual meeting, the photo from our annual meeting taken in April a year ago. We're having another one in April of this year. Uh, there's an Irish anthem of the island of Ireland. It's the rugby anthem, actually. And one of the verses goes, together we stand tall. Uh, I strongly believe in that, uh, in teamwork, in cooperation. Uh, it's another way of saying we need the right chemistry. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the generous support I've had from funding agencies and from companies uh, since I moved to Ireland in 2013. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation and your attention. And last, I have one more little animation, if it'll do it for me. Maybe not. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I was going to show you the image from our equivalent meeting, and it looks an awful lot like this one. <laughs> okay. Thank you, okay. Professor Zarotko. What an inspiring talk. Uh, just before we move to the Q, uh, QA uh, session, I would like to let you know that I, we all share you the same concern about climate change, but personally, I do believe in the beauty of crystals and the plenty of things that we can do with these crystals. So, to the audience now, please, if you have some questions. If not, I can start. Oh, okay. Please, one mic here. It's hard to see from up here. Yeah. yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor. That's, uh, I would say, it's a really a light thing about the uh, future. What I missed in, in, in your presentation is a question of timeline. Of course, this is a science uh, part of the future, but uh, as a non-specialist, I don't see what, how long it will take to get there in terms of applications. Because, for instance, they say to capture the water yep. the, into the limit is the, is the sky, or no, maybe even beyond it. But, but how much time this science is going to take? The science is ready for prototypal devices today. Um, it took us two years. This is not like pharmaceutical development where you can spend a billion and go eight years and it fails <laughs> at the end, right? Um, the chemistry part is the most obviously obvious part that's going to work. If you already have prototypes and you just need to tweak them, you're going to get there. Uh, I would say it's more a question of investment and motivation than money, though. Uh, and I, I don't think the timelines are excessive. If you set out to make a machine with a proprietary sorbent, you could do it in two years. If I may follow up on that just very quickly, that's what you said on prototyping. What about uh, scaling? For this to have uh, some sort of a significant impact? Well, the scaling for which application, though? Right? For water harvesting, you're talking about something you could have in your house the size of a coffee maker. And there are, I'm not the only person who's interested in atmospheric water harvesting. Uh, so for water harvesting, it's small devices in many locations. Uh, for CO2, for direct air capture, to change the atmosphere, that's beyond comprehension. I would say. But for CO2, for niche applications, it's doable now. Climeworks could sell you a machine 
and you could produce CO2 to put into a conversion process and produce a product. But we're not talking about the scale of climate change at this point, or close. I think there are many engineering challenges as well there, not just chemistry challenges. Yeah, as we are running out of time, we'll take two other questions. I but have a question. Yeah, for sure. Uh, professor, <coughs> thank you very much for your distinguished lecture. So I'm Devajit, but I'm an assistant professor. So I have a very technical questions about MOF. So when you uh, talk about the gas separation in MOF uh, regarding its selectivity, so regard, uh, like when you make the membrane, so how you control this actual MOF selectivity for particular gas? Well, did, did you mention membrane in there? Yeah, for MOF, like a powder state, if we translate it to a MOF membrane for the gas separation purpose, well, I, I don't see membranes, I see rotors. Okay. So I see the same process that was used for uh, water being used for CO2. But there are other, uh, I'm working with a company uh, on DAC, there's no membrane, there's no rotor. <laughs> there's, no, there's no moving part. So, uh, so this, is the next, this is the engineering side. Um, Got it. So a membrane is not the only way to do the separations. It might be necessary for the super large scale, uh, but you know, I'm working with a DAC company that is not using membranes, is using coated surfaces and no moving parts. Okay, thank you very much. One last question. So back to CO2. Yes. Uh, so I, I agree with you. Uh, going after CO2 in the air is a difficult task, and, and frankly, uh, proofs of efficacy are, are, are unclear. Um, now, when it comes to uh, captures, capturing CO2 with your membranes, let's say, or your yep. your MOFs or whatever. Uh, at right at the industry, that is uh, metal mills, uh, oil production, and so on. Do you think that this is more feasible? Well, it would be, except what are you going to do with the CO2 when you've captured it? Chemi chemistry? I'll do glycerol. I'll do, uh, I'll do many things. Chemistry yeah. uh, from CO2 is actually yeah. a but you know, CO2 is a commodity, right? So there was panic in Ireland two years ago when there was a CO2 shortage and beer was going to run out, right? So CO2 is, is used as a commodity in its own right. So wh where there's a use, you just simply capture it on site. For flue gas, you still have to do something with it. Now, if you can't use it, you're going to have to store it and bury it or transport it. So I'm not sure about the, the flue gas side of it. Um, uh, I would think that DAC, where you have on-site use, utilization of the CO2 captured, is ultimately the best way to go forward. That's my personal feeling. Yeah. Well, there, there are a few examples of uh, low-cost production from CO2 capture at that site. Not to mention a few industries that I know, but uh, yeah. indeed this is feasible. Well, it's, it's been feasible for 100 years, <laughs> but at what cost, right? There is uh, at what energy cost? No, um, you're right. They, yeah. This is, a, this is a yet an issue, but uh, yeah. I, th I think that there are a few examples where it costs, it, the cost is quite reasonable. But my understanding is that the energy costs are extremely high. So the actual cost of the materials might be low, and it can be done at a large scale, but there's a large energy footprint associated with it. With physisorbents, you're not talking about a 10% reduction in energy. You're talking about a 90%, 70, 80, 90% reduction, because you're releasing at much, much lower temperatures. That's the attractive part of this. It's not just the capture, it's the release. Thank you so much. Just to let you know, Professor Zawrotko will stay among us till Thursday, so you can reach out to him whenever you want. 
and please join me for a round of applause for Professor Zawrotko. Thank you. Thank you. How wonderful. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Ashraf. Did an amazing job there, Professor. It was a privilege to have you on stage. Thank you again for sharing your input with us. It is time for us to continue our journey, ladies and gentlemen, around different transitions facing our world. We are moving now to climate change. I'm sure many of you are interested by this topic and more specifically, air quality and the interlinkage with climate change. These two environmental issues are not isolated problems, but must be closely looked at each other. As interactions with students and with all of you is really how this week has been designed, I am really glad to call on stage another PhD student, and her name is Iman, so let's give her a round of applause. Iman, if you may join me, please. Hello, hello. So we are going to welcome together your speakers. I guess they have 15 minutes each, and then we will open up to questions. So let's welcome them together. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in welcoming to the stage Professor Guy Brasseur, <laughs> Professor Ravi, Professor Paolo Lage, as they're making their way to the stage. And finally, we are really thrilled to have someone represent us from Morocco. And it's Mrs. Kinza Khomsi. Let's give them a round of applause. Take it away, Iman. The view from here is too different. <laughs> you have to try it, guys, if you didn't before. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, their UM6P community, their colleagues, professors, and of course, our esteemed guests, welcome to our session, the air quality and climate change interlinked. I am Qadri Iman, I'm a PhD student here in the UM6P, and I'm working on the air quality and climate files. I'm glad to be here to represent you some of the greatest scientists in this field. We are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change, and the last generation that c can do something about it. Climate change, global warming, extreme weather condition, natural hazard, low precipitation in some areas, and flooding in others are all manifestations of a much bigger issues. We talk about the climate change, the air quality, or the pollu air pollution. Today, together, we are going to try to understand the different connections between them. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to represent you and welcome our first speaker, a Nobel Prize laureate and one of the greatest scientists and the director of Max Planck Institute for Meteorology Hamburg. With a remarkable career in this field, Dr. Brasser brings a unique and valuable perspective to our conference. Mr. Guy Brasser, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much for your kind introduction. You just said that you are the generation that will be facing climate change in a very substantial way. And that's maybe why I was asked by my colleague here to give you perhaps what I could say an historical perspective on issue related to environmental changes. So I would like to uh, find the, this here. 
And basically what I would like to do, rather than giving you an historical lecture, is really to tell you a story. A story about, that starts at least with a person who in 19, or 1839 discovered one of the chemical compounds in the atmosphere that is ozone. This person is Christian Schönbein. And so, on an evening of March 1839, Schönbein, who was a professor at the University of Basel, gave a talk that, uh, to the Natural Science Society in his uh, city and indicated that while he was conducting an electrolysis of water, he was smelling a strange odor, and he didn't know what it was. Was it really attributed to maybe the electrodes that were eroding, or was it an emission of some kind of gas that was coming out? There's been 30 years of debate about this question. Schoenbein believed that it was a gas, perhaps chlorine, perhaps some hydrogenated gases, but others were debating this. In reality, very soon, after, well, soon, five or six years later, two other scientists, also in Switzerland, but this time in Geneva, said, no, this odor that is produced by when this electrical gas is electrolyzes happens also when we are with oxygen only situations. So it must be a compound of oxygen. Schoenbein didn't buy this and believed that it was perhaps something different, namely uh, electrified form of oxygen that was basically a positive form that was compensated, had to be compensated by a negative form, which they called end ozone, a kind of an anti-ozone that was produced at the same time of ozone. Finally, a few years later, in 1863, Sora in Geneva said, no, no, ozone is composed of three oxygen atoms. And the story of endozone disappeared very quickly. But I just want to show you that sometimes something that comes a bit as a surprise as you conduct a laboratory study leads to essentially a study that will last, or discussion that will last maybe 30 years, 40 years before you solve a problem. Science is a hard job. Science is full of controversies. Science is full of errors. But finally, the truth wins. And ozone was recognized first in the laboratory, but then soon after it appeared to be really present in the atmosphere. And for example, in Paris, Albert Lévy measured ozone during many years at this observatory that was in the Parc Montsouris in Paris that has disappeared now but it's a very interesting building, a copy of a palace from Tunisia, in fact, that was brought during one of the World Fairs of Paris in this park that was used as an observatory. So it highlights not only the laboratory work is important, but the observational work outside in the atmosphere is important. Later on, Fabry and Buisson, two scientists in Marseille, in France, made the first measurements of the column of ozone, the amount of ozone we have at high altitude above our heads in the atmosphere, and found out that the layer of ozone, if it had to be brought to the surface, was less than five millimeters thick. In spite of that, was protecting us strongly from the damage that ultraviolet radiation from the sun could be uh, causing. Another scientist in the UK this time, Gordon Dobson, built an instrument 
to measure systematically ozone in many parts of the world. And now we see that instrument development is also part of the uh, scientific adventure when you want to solve the problem. It shows in particular that ozone was most abundant in the winter time, and particular had high latitude, which left completely open the scientific explanation about how ozone was really formed, because clearly ozone in the stratosphere was not formed by the electrolysis of water. So, was it really present in the stratosphere? That was still an open question, because Dobson's measurements were made from the ground. So in Germany, before World War II, and then later on in the US, using balloons, some of them were man-made, were providing the first vertical profile of ozone, showing a maximum in the concentration around 20 kilometer altitude. Later on, after World War II, a number of German rockets were brought to the US, were launched with spectrometer on board, <clears throat> recovered when the rocket collapsed after its journey in the atmosphere, and were bringing back information about the vertical distribution of ozone up to 70 kilometer altitude. But then still, we needed, to the explain, we needed the explanation. How is ozone formed? I told you that ozone was most abundant at high latitude. So probably for many people, it was created by solar particles coming down in polar region and exciting the oxygen of the atmosphere. But a brilliant scientist, Sina Chapman, came up with another explanation. Ozone is produced by solar radiation itself, it photolyzes, it dissociates O2, and that's the beginning of a mechanism to produce ozone. He also suggested that ozone could recombine with atomic oxygen as a loss, but quick calculations showed that that was not sufficient to explain as a loss to explain the observed concentration that the rockets has been and, the, and, and others have been produced. So additional destruction mechanisms had to be invoked and we had to wait, to, uh, to, well, 40 years, no, first 20 years before Bates and Nicholas suggested that hydrogen compounds could destroy ozone, another 20 years before Paul Critzen indicated that the nitrogen oxides were able to destroy ozone pretty rapidly, and then uh, in 1974, Stolaski and Cicero showed the importance of chlorine as an agent to destroy ozone in the stratosphere. And so, the theory is another ingredient for the understanding of a problem. And the theory led very quickly to the development of the first model you see here the first ozone model developed in 1936 at a time where many of the laboratory ingredients to the models, in other words, the measurements of the kinetics parameters that explain the reactions production, producing or destroying ozone had not been yet obtained. And so the models were very approximate and had to wait for more detailed laboratory investigation. I'm getting also in trouble. Other observation came up. The space age gave the community a very good opportunity to not only have observation at single point, but also global observation here in this case of ozone. So the problem seemed to be solved. But then came a few alarms. First of all, Harold Johnson at the University of, California, uh, of Berkeley, California, found out that if nitrogen oxide are a way to destroy ozone, the injection of nitrogen oxide, for example, by a plant fleet in 1970, it was a plant fleet 
of supersonic aircraft could perhaps destroy ozone by 50%, up to 50%, which would have been a huge, dramatic increase in solar radiation reaching the surface, in particular radiation that is harmful to people, to the biosphere in general. But then came a surprise. In the early 80s, a British scientist that nobody really knew in the community, but who was doing routine measurements of ozone at a British Antarctic basis, observation basis, measurement basis, reported that ozone was dramatically decreasing over the station in Antarctica. No model had uh, predicted this. Nobody had even, even indicated that that could happen. What was the reason for that? A full surprise, which is another lesson that we are learning. We have surprises and we have to address them. So, at that time, we didn't have a lot of satellite data but very, on this, but very soon we could see the ozone hole appearing over Antarctica and we still had no real explanation. We knew from Roland and Molina, you see here, that we had increasing level of chlor chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, in the stratosphere. And here in the middle, you see the first observation from space of the ozone hole. Very soon, NASA, NOAA, and other agencies in the U.S. said, we need to send the best scientists in Antarctica to observe, measure, and try to understand what is happening. What is the cause of this unexpected surprise ozone depletion? Susan Solomon, you see here, suggested that chlorine from the CFCs could be excited on layers of clouds that are observed over Antarctica during the winter. You see the polar stratospheric clouds in the middle shown here. And that kind of led to an explanation, basically the presence of the particles the transformation of chlorine reservoir into reactive chlorine on the surface of this particle. And so it introduced really a new type of chemistry in our field, which is heterogeneous chemistry, playing a big role, an important role in the stratosphere and an understanding why the ozone hole was produced. The loss was due to the CFCs, but to the special uh, chemistry involving the presence of polar stratospheric clouds. And so the models were able to absorb this new knowledge and finally predict how the ozone hole would evolve in the future, which was the basis for essentially a discussion at the political level about how to address the problem, what measures should be taken to mitigate the ozone hole, and finally come up with a solution which was the banning, the phase out of the chlorofluorocarbons and the replacement by other less harmful products. And so all that gives us lessons. We went from an ozone discovery to an ozone recovery today and essentially we can ask us what lessons have we learned from a story that is at the end of it was frightening at the beginning, but it appeared to be, at the end, a successful story. Maybe a good example for issue about CO2, climate, greenhouse gases, and climate. So what have we learned? Most studies usually start with some qualitative information. They're often associated with a surprise. They're not planned. They're not in the books. They're not in the proposals necessarily. The interpretation is complex. Errors sometimes happen and they're part of the process and we have to accept that. But as we heard this morning, scientists have the right to do errors, but the community needs to correct them. 
Observations are the first step to document and understand the processes that are involved. The next step is to move from this qualitative approach to a more quantitative approach. Quantitative to really measure, to really understand, and finally to predict. Laboratory investigations are key. Then models are developed only when sufficient experimental data is available. They are very helpful for the interpretation of observation, observation from the ground, observation in situ, observation from space. And then finally, curiosity-driven research is essential and needs to be preserved even though the governments are telling you you need to do applied science only, because curiosity-driven driven science really leads, sometimes many years later, to information that becomes very important for society. So that's what I would like, I wanted to tell you as an introduction to this debate by taking a little bit of a step backwards to think about how a story like this can really help us to address new problems that are basically facing our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guy Brasser, for your various presentation. I think the best way to understand the issues, of course, is to understand the history. And now, moving to our second lecture, a scientist specializing in chemistry and atmospheric science with a special focus on stratospheric ozone de depletion, climate change, and air quality. A professor in the chemical chemistry and atmospheric science department at Colorado State University, also the former director of the chemical sciences division at NOAA, the National o Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administra Administration. Mr. Ravi Shankara, or Ravi. Okay, I'll try to switch gears. What I'm going to talk about is transitions in our thinking about climate change and air quality, keeping with the theme of transitions. I'm a chemical physicist by training, so I just want to make sure I, I define the word transition. Transition to me means going from one state to another. Okay, it could take different amounts of time, but here I'm talking about a transition in our thinking about a few different issues facing today, specifically climate change and air pollution. And I'm not going to say much about the ozone layer depletion that Guy already described. The common wisdom used to be that the world is huge, there's, people can't do anything to the world, and the world does something to people. It kind of makes sense. If you look at the picture on, the, on your left, what you see is a reconstructed temperature of the Earth's surface. So if you look at it carefully, for the last 10,000 years, this is the Holocene epoch, the temperature hasn't changed much. It has been constant to about one degree. And before that, of course, there's glaciers and there's ice age and all that stuff. So the humanity, as we know, has developed with this constant temperature. And it also kind of makes sense when you think about it, things are vast. If you look at the Earth's atmosphere itself, most of it is nitrogen and oxygen. If you look at the small sliver, it, it's about it's CO2. I'm, I'm not showing water because this is dry air. So CO2 is in parts per million. It's very tiny, okay? And so it's kind of understandable, you think that you can't do anything about it. Now, of course, you could ask yourself the question, why 
is that the case that such small amounts of things can have such huge impacts? I'm not going to answer that question <coughs> right now, but we can debate that afterwards. The first transition in our thinking came about a long time ago in some ways, that humans actually can alter their nearby environment in harmful ways. So one was air quality, the other was acid precipitation. I'm showing air quality most recently, but people worried about air quality way back. Some of the kings in England would ban wood burning, and you know, if you were caught burning wood, it made smoke, you could be executed, etc. And there are people have known that you can actually make your, your situation bad by doing certain things. But on a larger scale, how did it happen? The air pollution was one of the first things we thought about. And then came acid precipitation. This is not something most people think about, but essentially the acid precipitation was one of the first of these transnational issues. People burning coal in UK were killing, without, or trill, killing trees in Norway. Coal, coal burning in America was destroying forests in Canada and things of that nature. Then came the other interesting thing that Guy just showed you, that we actually figured it was impressed upon us that humans can actually alter the atmosphere on a global scale. To me, this, one of the first one of those was the ozone hole and the ozone layer depletion. Incidentally, these transitions I'm gonna tell you about are my views. You could have completely different views or you can completely disagree with these. Okay. So, the humans can alter the atmosphere the ozone layer was being depleted. There are some other graphs showing how this happens. Then the question, of course, we always have to ask is, how does this happen? In this particular case, it turns out a very small amount, this is not even parts per million, it's in parts per billion. Think of just a few people in the world being able to do the destruction of the world. The population of the earth is 8.4 billion, and if 100 people could do, you know, destroy the whole world, it, or something like that. But why does it do it? In this particular case, it turns out to be a very simple chemistry. It is called homogeneous catalysis. Okay? So we do know, and knowing why it does is very important. The third transition kind of was gradual. This is one of the biggest challenges facing today, is the, the human activities are increasing greenhouse gases. So if you look at the trend in the concentrations of the three of the major greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, this on the left-hand side, you can see they're all exponentially going up. Okay. In fact, I can plot a lot of other things on that scale the number of McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, they all look the same, okay? And so does it with the population. On the right-hand side is what's called the Keeling Curve. Uh, that's measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory of this global CO2 concentration, and there's going up um, constantly. It is not like doubled, unlike CFCs and things of that nature. It is, the concentration before industrialization was about 280 parts per uh, million, and now it's about 420 parts per million. Okay. So it's really going up, but the rate of change is what is really important. Look at the rate at which these things are going up. The transition four, I'll tell you from my point of view, is realizing it is not just greenhouse gases. It is greenhouse gases and pollution that do this together. And actually, it turns out, one of the pollutions, that is aerosols or particulate matter, really offsets the greenhouse gas effects, okay? So you can actually see this. And in fact, 
you can calculate something else called a cumulative radiative forcing. The point of that, forget the science jargon, is it is not just what you're doing today that matters. It is what you have done in the past. Your legacy matters. So this is another major transition in our thinking that has happened. So the consequence of this, for example, I'll just show you in a paper we wrote, um, is what is the contribution to global climate change today and in 2100 by various countries? So if you look at it, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated slide, but if you look at just the dark bars, you can see that North America, which is essentially Canada and the US and Europe, have contributed a very big chunk of it. And in fact, if you look at countries like India and China, even though we talk about them, they have contributed very little. The reason is they have sacrificed human health to offset climate change. I'll show you that in a second. There's another key point I want to make. This whole thing we are talking about is actually a small amount of difference, small difference in energy. The total amount of energy we're talking here is in, in a strange unit, it's called yotta joules. The total amount of energy we get from the sun every year is approximately two and a half yotta joules. The total amount of electricity we produce every year is about 0.02% of that. Okay. It's a very tiny, tiny amount. So. The transition five to me is that many environmental issues are coupled. So here I show you the two phases of particulate matter, that's PM with the aerosol. First, as I just showed you, it offsets climate change, but at the same time, it's very bad for human health. How much does it do that? So I'm gonna just show you examples of what we have calculated for India, where I'm originally from. And the way the human health is affected by PM 2.5 is you breathe it and you can have various parts of your body of, of being affected by it. I'm gonna just classify them into four different uh, kind of effects as you'll see in a second. So if you look at the pollution in countries like America, it actually is getting better. On the other hand, if I look, this is a satellite image on the right-hand side of the Indo-Gangetic Plain in India, and you can see the amount of pollution. In fact, you can see the pollution in this room. Just look at those light beams. The fact that you can see the light beams tells you that there is plenty of particles in this room. And then you can calculate based on some of our knowledge what is the effect of this on um, premature mortality. I'm using premature mortality as an index for calculating the effect. First, on, the, on these pictures, I'll show you the effect in India on heart attack, stroke, COPD, and lung cancer, and the total. The key thing I want to point out is our calculations, which agrees with some of the others, is roughly 1.4 million premature mortalities per year. Okay due to pollution. Okay, now the other transition that has happened in our thinking is that we think of air pollution as an urban issue, that it happens in cities. That is actually not true. For example, if you look at the air pollution in India between urban and non-urban, and I don't want to call it rural because there's a distinction you see that it's actually the same. It's the third graph on the, um, in the middle, which shows that the urban and non-urban um, annual mortality per million is essentially the same. The fourth point I want to make with this is, look at a country like Bangladesh. Bangladesh has no prayer of controlling its air pollution by itself. What happens in India affects Bangladesh. And the same thing is true in many other parts of the world. Okay? 
So there is a spatial and temporal convergence of scales also for air quality and climate. This is, a, my, in my view, the transition number seven is that we used to think of glo glo climate change as global and air pollution as local. They're converging into the same scale because the effect of climate change is not just global. It is different in different parts of the world. So for example, if you look at the sea level changes, even though Bangladesh has not contributed much to climate change, they're gonna be affected a lot more than the peak other countries that have contributed to the climate change. So there's that whole issue of convergence. Here's my last, or nearly last slide, transitions in our thinking is that when you realize the coupling of issues, the solution to environmental issues are also coupled. It is coupled both positively or negatively. It could be compensated or it could be exasperated. So for example, fossil fuel is a major source of CO2 and air pollution. It's also an agent that acidifies ocean. So if People are thinking about geoengineering to offset the radiation stuff. It's not going to help anything with ocean acidification. Coal is a source of SO2 that causes acid rain and poor air quality. Ozone depletion, they're elim eliminating the ozone depletion substances helped not only the ozone layer, but also climate change. In fact, if we hadn't stopped emitting CFCs, CFCs would have been just as important, maybe even more than CO2 by now as climate forcing agents. So the other thing to think about are solutions can have unintended consequences. Does reforestation to reduce CO2, is that really a panacea? Does it really not affect any other uh, issues that we think about? Does reforestation cause more ground level ozone change? When you realize that there are these linkages in solutions and the problems, that also makes it very clear that policies have to be linked. In making policies and executing policies, you have to, to link all these environmental issues. And lastly, this is a little bit of a controversial statement this is more a belief. I believe that the management and environmental issues are not solved. You just manage it. It is like human health. You're not gonna all of a sudden make everybody completely what they were. You kind of manage their health and make things as better as possible. So I wanna end with this, that so far humans have affected only Earth hopefully not the rest of the universe. But this is a cartoon from La Gary Larson which says that the boson layer, which is a pun on ozone layer, shielding the rest of the solar system from the Earth system. I miss these cartoons incidentally. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ravi. You asked me before if I'm gonna stop you if you uh, pass <laughs> uh, the time, but I couldn't because it was uh, very interesting. So I'm gonna ask kindly the rest of our speakers if they can uh, just to respect the time. Then we're gonna have leave some time for questions and discussion uh, in, the, uh, in the end. To delve deeper into this perspective on air quality and human health, uh, let's turn to Mr. Paulo Laj, senior scientist at the University Grenoble Alps in France and University Helansky, Finland. You are one of the coordinators on, of the European Resource Infrastructure Act Actress 
aerosol cloud and trust gases research infrastructure, and recently the head of the atmospheric environmental research division within the science and innovation department of the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. Mr. Paulo, congratulations for your position, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Iman. Thank you very much for the invitation as well. Don't hesitate to tell me if I'm passing the time I'm allowed to. And uh, I would like to give this talk following up on uh, both Guy and Javi's presentation. From Guy, I will try to show you an example of uh, positive uh, results of a public policy. And from Ravi, I will continue talking about this link between uh, air quality and health. And I would like to start with uh, something that, uh, a statement that came from WHO, the World Health Organization, a few years ago, 2014. And they actually, uh, from the uh, scientific studies, they actually issued this statement with the number of uh, premature deaths uh, due to air pollution in the world. Ravi mentioned that already, but it is about uh, 3.7 million people dying of air pollution, of ambient air pollution, plus 4.3 million people dying of indoor air pollution. And that makes air pollution one of the most uh, effective ways of killing people in the world. And what you see in, this, uh, in the graph with the world is that about from countries to countries, it varies, but in some countries, it's about more than 20% of the total deaths that are actually attributable to poor air quality, both outside and inside the habitations. And you see that even in Morocco, there is something about 10 to 12% of the deaths that can be attributed to bad air quality. And that's, a, that's a, a, an issue for the countries. And obviously, there was something that had to be done. But first, let me discuss a bit how uh, they came with these estimates. It's actually from research. You can, do, uh, you can try to see how pollution is affecting human health by doing either in vivo experiments and you have an example here, you take living organisms, even uh, people, like the one you have in the box there, perhaps a PhD student of uh, white. Uh, you expose them to a high level or level of air pollution and you see, uh, you take samples from blood, from uh, urine, from, uh, and you see whether there is a reaction and you can have an effect in uh, understand the effect on health. You can also do that with just the cells. You expose the cells to, uh, to air pollution and you see how the cells are reacting, whether they, they, they produce metabolites or whether they die from air pollution. You can also have a different approach with population, with court study. You follow people for years and years and you see whether those who are exposed to higher air pollution are uh, affecting uh, their health is more affected than those who are not exposed to air pollution. Or you do epidemiological studies, so you follow, uh, you see how the people are exposed to air pollution, uh, to uh, particulate pollution, for example, in a certain district in an area, and then you try to connect that with the way people are entering hospitals, uh, and if there is a connection between high pollution levels and the fact that you have more people going to hospitals to, to, to get uh, cured and because of different uh, reasons. So this is, this is the way uh, the studies are done for connecting air pollution and health. And actually the, uh, the, uh, the synthesis to that is what we call those response relationship. And this is the graph that you have here where you see that more pollution you have, the more mortality you have. It's almost a straight line, it's me, which means that even at very low level, you can have also death attributable to air pollution. 
So you might, no one in the room, in, the, in this uh, auditorium, I believe, will know that uh, anyone who died of air pollution. This is a paradox because, indeed, if you believe this is the same kind of studies that are used to show that tobacco smoking is actually bad for your health. And so tobacco smoking and health, this is something that we all know. Air quality and health, no one knows of anyone who died of air quality, but it's, it's not true. Actually, there are a number of deaths, even in here in Morocco, attributable to air, quality, to, to air pollution. So this is just to tell you that uh, these studies are the same as the studies connecting tobacco smoke and air pollution. So I hope that you believe these estimates are right. When you died of air pollution, you don't die of only of asthma, you die also of uh, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and this is why the connection is not so straightforward. So the countries, they had to do something about it, and I asked my colleague in China to send me a few examples of what China did. And in these graphs, you see uh, the difference between the pollution in China from 2013 to 2017, so a few years. So this is in blue, uh, left-hand side, the difference between 2013 and 2017. And you see that in the big cities in China, we have overall a 30% decrease in a few years of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the pollution from the particulate pollution. So in Beijing, we used to have in uh, more than 100 microgram per cubic meter of particulate pollution in 2013. Now we have 38. This is in 2020. A huge increase, a huge improvement in air quality. And we have the same trend in the US and in Europe. This is uh, affecting health positive, positively. This decrease, actually, we can calculate in China, this is always for China, that the, between 2013 and 2017, they have saved more than 100,000 lives because of this decrease of, uh, this improvement of air quality. And if we ask the Chinese how they, they've done that, they tell you, they give you uh, this kind of table with all the actions they took uh, to change the way uh, the emission, the, the, to reduce emission from cars, from uh, uh, the industries, from all the parts of the society which is actually emitting air pollution. And this is where I want to go to a bit the discussion that again is following up on Guy and, and Ravi. What is actually driving this, uh, this, positive, uh, this positive example of a public policy that works. So this is a graph that shows how the uh, cars are actually improving with time. This is the amount of uh, emission of a pollutant uh, per kilometer and how it changed with time. And you see that, in fact, engineers are very good. They are making the cars uh, less polluting. So this is over a, uh, about a, 40, a 50 year period and, and you see that actually the technology, and that goes back to your presentation, technology is quite efficient, uh, but when you think about it, so it decreased by the emission of a normal car by 85% over 50 years, 50 years. And when you start to think about other actions that we can do, you can think of actions that are more, I would say, structural driven. Decision by a state. Decision that we have incentive for electric cars. If you had that and you change your uh, gasoline car with an electric car, your consumption goes for the pollutants from a number to zero in about a day, the day you change your car. That's much more efficient in a way than the technology. Of course, you need the technology for electric cars as well. 
And if you add to that uh, behavior-driven uh, actions, so you, you tell people not to take their car or to, to do some car sharing, let's think about car sharing. Instead of one person in a car, you ask two people in the car. Then you've decreased the emission per kilometer by two because you have two people who are sharing these emissions. And again, this can be done in a day. So these ways of dealing with uh, environmental problems is to be reflected upon the, when you're talking about transition. Fit for purpose policies, market ready technologies, sustained funding for that seems to be an optimal solution. But you see that it has limitation and in fact in China the, the decrease in air pollution, uh, in the decrease in the improvement of air pollution is actually flattening now. Perhaps because it is only technology driven so far and perhaps a bit structural driven. And perhaps what we need, and it's in the, the form of a question mark, especially for Iman, you say, the last generation that can do something, and I fully share what you said, the last generation that can do something may have to think about much complex issues that are not only engineering issues or the, uh, the issues that can be dealt with the, the scientists from the pure or the, uh, the, the physicists, the chemists and, and these solutions. Maybe you have to think about society as a complex world and see what are the ingredients for an env environmental transitions. It's not simple, it's a question mark and I'd say that your generation will have to sort that out and, and make uh, and understand what makes the solutions and the transitions, the positive transitions feasible. And with that, I will let you uh, for to the next talk and for the next questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Paul Lulaj. It's a very alarming situation. So, uh, representing the Moroccan contribution in the atmospheric field. Engineer, PhD, and air quality and climate expert. We have with us the head of the depart uh, air quality department in the uh, general directorate of meteorology in Morocco. We have, and the woman with the who I discovered the air quality file for the very first time. I'm honored to represent you, ladies and gentlemen, Madame Kinza Khomsi. Thank you so much, Iman. Good afternoon, everybody. Are you okay? Hey, please follow with me and be awake. That's great. Okay. Um, so, I, when I came here, and I know that we are talking about the science week, and am I, I am asking myself, am I a scientist? And let me share a secret with you. I, I joined the National Weather Service in 2005. I got the air quality department in 2016. And in the air quality department, I was kind of in the middle between scientists and policymakers. And I was attracted to go with scientists and then I returned back. And then I was attracted to go with policymakers and then I returned back. And then I decided to go to scientists to learn from them, watch them, and go back to policymakers and tell them this is what scientists do. And then I returned back to scientists and tell them this is what policymakers want. So if I want to call myself something today, I call myself a bridge who is advocating science as a public good. And this is exactly what I will share with you today. My colleagues talked about ozone, air quality, climate, the impact of all these on health. And 
I will share with you a concrete example on how all this is connected and how we can use our scientific understanding to solve all the problems on a, on, on a case study or a successful work that was done on Africa. Yeah, so basically we will be talking about challenges and opportunities and I am African and I know many of you here are Africans as well. And if you are African, this means that you, are, you have one out of five of chance to belong to one of these five regions. North Africa, East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. So let's just imagine that we have one person from each region, and these five people are around the table discussing. First of all, they need to find one language to talk with. The fact that we don't have one language to talk with in the continent means that there is a huge diversity within the continent. Diversity in languages, diversity in the culture, and when we are talking about diversity in culture, this means that there is a diversity, a wealth of diversity in everything. In the continent, we have diversity in vegetation, desert, forest land, grassland. We have diversity in land use, cropland, rainforests. We have diversity in climate, desert climate in the north, tropical climate in the center, temperate zone in the south. We have diversity in the population. We have regions with high population and we have regions with low population. And of course, as long as we have this diversity, we also have diversity in economical activities. Agriculture is the main axis of work in Africa. However, we do have uh, manufacturing points. We do have fishing activities as well. So basically, these five people who are from the different regions can talk without stop about the huge diversity in Africa. However, when they will decide to talk about the challenges we do have, or the main challenge we do have, it will go with it without saying that they will agree on one main challenge, which is universal, and which is the growth in population. So basically, the population will triple uh, in Africa in 2063. In 2018, Africa, our population in Africa was of 70% from the whole world. In 2063, it will be 30% from the population in the whole world. So the increase in the population means the increase in the household. This means that there will be a pressure against all the resources that exist in Africa. So there will be more demand in for energy, more demand for transport, more waste created, and we will not be able to reach all the goals we do have. So this is the main challenge. And then, if these five people will decide to talk about the opportunities, or the main opportunity as well, they will find that there is, or they are already subscribed to a global sustainability agenda. So Africa, or many countries in Africa, are part of the Sustainable Development Goals Framework. They are part of the Paris Agreement, and they are part of the agenda we want. The agenda, the, the agenda of the Africa we want. The Africa we want is the agenda that will be, or projected to be realized in 2063 by the African continent. And basically, in 2063, we want to reach a prosperous Africa, a wealthy Africa, a stable Africa, which is empowered by the arms of its population, mainly women, uh, youth, and we want a sustainable and resilient Africa with regards to environmental and climate issues. So if these five people decide to consider these opportunities, they can think about a framework to make this possible. And this is exactly what happened 
through the assessment report project. So it is a project that was led by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and UNDEP with uh, the application of many African countries. And the objective was to create a, an assessment of climate and air quality in Africa. And by the end, suggest measures to deal with the different problems. So the process was very inclusive. Many people from Africa participated, scientists and policymakers. We had the civil society there. The, um, the objective was to link policy with the science and to use modeling as a trustworthy tool nowadays in science to come up with the different scenarios that would happen in the future and that would not happen if we apply uh, measures or possible measures. So basically, the assessment reports dig deeply in the challenges. And in the report, we started, or we, uh, we started by choosing a baseline. So we have chosen the baseline scenario from 2000 and 2018. And we have seen the emissions and we have said, okay, if we do nothing, what will happen? Definitely a catastrophe. So what will happen? An increase in carbon dioxide and all the greenhouse gases, including the short-lived climate pollutants, which are ozone, methane, hydrocarbons, and black carbon. For the climate, we will not be able to respect the Paris Agreement by being under 2 degrees C. We will have warming in the country. In rainfall, some models are saying we will have uh, a drying, and some models, no. But anyways, climate, we are threatened with regards to the climate. Considering air quality and the impact on health, so if we continue with the baseline scenario, what will happen is that we will have an increase in the concentration of PM and O3, and also we will have deaths. And also we will have deaths and we will have mortality. So then, what's, what they said is this. So what they found is this, or in the report say that in Africa we do have five main sectors where we need to implement measures. So we have waste, we have agriculture, we have energy, we have transport, and we have household. And 37 measures were suggested so that we can mitigate the impact of air quality and climate on health and other different sectors. So what happened is that we considered these measures and we considered two scenarios. One scenario related to reducing short-lived climate pollutants and another scenario related to reducing greenhouse gas. So this is what happened. So when we implemented the scenario and we checked what will happen, we found that there will be a drastic decrease in greenhouse gases and CO2 will be cut by 55% in 2063. The transport will, will help in reducing 32% of the total emission for industry 40%, 14% and for electricity 48%. As for climate, what we found that there will, there will be no impact on temperature and the temperature will continue in increasing. This is because, and we know it very much, Africa is not part of greenhouse of emissions of the global greenhouse gases and its climate or its greenhouse, long-lived greenhouse gases are more impacted by what is coming from the global world. For the rainfall, it was amazing to see that Africa is able to shift from a drying climate to a wet climate with a great uncertainty because we are using models by the end and there is a great uncertainty related to aerosols. But it was shown that through the models that we do have that the scenario is possible to move from a dry climate, mainly in the Sahel part, to a wet climate. As for air quality, for sure, as long as we are reducing emissions, we will reduce the concentration of PM in the 
air and also of ozone. And of course, we will uh, increase the mortality from uh, PM and also from ozone. So this is to say that definitely we can use science uh, in, in a practical way so that we can mitigate emissions, so that we can uh, save human health. And if I have something to say or to finish with is, Africa now has a huge opportunity to continue developing sustainably, improve human well-being, and protect nature by investing in solutions to fight climate change and air pollution together. And I will let you with a reflection what will happen if we don't act. Thank you so much. I came to the end. Thank you, Dr. Kenza, for giving us an idea about the climate change and air quality in Africa. And now, I hope that we have, still have time. We're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> I'm sorry. We're gonna open the floor for questions and discussion. So please feel free if you have a question, raise your hand. Or maybe you can also use uh, the Campus Plus uh, application. Okay, my name is Aziz Mote. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, we are living in a revolution of artificial intelligence. So, what uh, this revolution will bring in terms of uh, science, in terms of advancements for science in atmospheric sciences? Thank you. So, if I understand your question, you're asking really what is the revolution in terms of modeling of the atmosphere. Is that right? So, first of all, I think that we have accomplished quite a bit historically in representing both the dynamics of the atmosphere and, in fact, if you look at how uh, the weather forecast has been improving over the last 30 years, 20 years, 10 years. It's been, in fact, dramatic. And so we have been witnessing what I would say a first revolution, which was the improvement of air quality, of, of uh, uh, weather forecast. And also, because it's linked, air quality forecast. The second revolution that we went through, because you want to think about revolution and transition, has been, I would say, the data revolution. The fact that we have been accessing large amount of data coming in particular from satellite, but also the development of uh, climate models that required essentially access to supercomputers. And that has been a, a very... Uh, the, a second revolution. The third revolution is underway. And that's the introduction of artificial intelligence in the way we are doing this business and how we can see uh, basically challenges but also opportunities in terms of treating data, of downscaling information and basically trying to do much more in terms of societal demands with much more efficient way than running very expensive models. So, modeling has been going on, but it's turning now into other approaches that are less relying on solving equations, the traditional equation, mass conservation, momentum conservation, energy conservation, into a much more statistical approach based on uh, deep uh, machine learning, for example. And we heard now that some, in some cases, weather prediction made by deep learning processes are of better successes than even if you do the traditional 
solving uh, different equations. So I don't know if this solves all your questions, but these are a few thoughts maybe on what the revolution and the transitions are. I think there is still a lot that we will be able to do by combining much better data and theoretical uh, approaches and also being much more interdisciplinary in terms of developing earth system models that mix to get mixed really uh, the atmosphere the ocean the biosphere but also needs to deal more and more with the social aspect and frankly we don't really know how to bring the more qualitative aspect of social science societal behavior societal responses into the traditional framework of modeling. Hey, uh, thank you, thank you very much for your presentation, all of you, so for this uh, interesting topic about the climate change. And uh, um, since I'm, I'm an astrophysicist, I would like to look at the picture from the front side. So I know that the, most of the climate change or the problem that's happening on our planet today, it's human things or human made things that we have to we're organizing this event and many other events like 2028 COP to convince our leaders to decide a good decision. That's that's great. But let's inverse the picture a little bit. And first I have a question and the comments. So the question is talking about the models and the involving the AI and the models and how they can help us in the future. So will you be considering for example something coming out from space like meteors? I know that we we know that the enter the atmosphere and they make some chemical element that they can uh, change the ozone and uh, other uh, property of our atmosphere. Will you be considering this? And we have seen them a lot. Will you be considering this in your model in order to improve our models to predict with, uh, uh, the weather in the, in, in, in the long future? My comments is, I know that the climate change is a big challenge for, our, for us as a humanity. So there's another thing also, it's related to the climate change and related to, to atmosphere or to the space, is the catastrophe that could be happened by meteors or asteroids that they're gonna hit the Earth. And this is a big problem. And I say that the whole world is making attention to the climate change, and I agree with them. We have to make a big attention to that. But also we have to bring other topics that they may be challenging our humanity. It's, for example, this object or the danger it's coming out from space, which means that we have to think out of the box, something coming from the space. So do we have to, or you agree to convince also our leaders to try to deal with these problems, which is something coming out of space, not made by human. And thank you very much. Okay. The issue of penetration of bodies, meteors, but also energetic particles coming from space, from the sun, cosmic particles, has been uh, treated in, in very much detail in some models. You can go in the literature and you will see some models that look at all these issues. i give you an example that's not as uh, extreme of a, of a big meteor chasing ozone or whatever that you mentioned, but for example, we know that when we have high solar activity like we have now, the upper atmosphere, 100 kilometer altitude, are extremely disturbed. Uh, in particular, we see more aurora. That's a, a result of that. The number, the concentration of nitrogen oxide that is produced by those energetic particles that penetrate in particular in high latitude regions uh, is enhanced by factor 10 or something like that. And by the way, I was talking about the ozone hole earlier. One of the hypotheses that was brought up at that time was that the ozone hole was produced by exactly one of those processes, that the nitrogen oxide produced at high altitude was coming down, and nitrogen oxide destroyed ozone. So that was a hypothesis, but that hypothesis was rejected very, very quickly because it didn't, it didn't really uh, support the uh, observations and, and, and the measurements. But yes, those issues are very much on, on the agenda, and if you want to talk to me, I'll give you a few references about those kind of studies. Hi, everyone. My name is Evelyn 
Kuria from Kenya. I am a farmer. My question is to the professor. Amazing presentations from the panel. Uh, my question is um, from Professor, the lady in the room. Um, it's on carbon markets and um, the formulas in trying to see about compensation of uh, carbon trading. Is this coming back to science and moving away from the politics of it? Is 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 it a viable solution that? getting funding from the Global North and then investing that funding and changing the ecosystem in Africa, is that, is that going to help in terms of the picture of reducing climate change or is it a hoax? Carbon trading. Okay. Thank you so much for the question. But before going on on the question, I want to uh, a little bit comment on, on, on the, the question before. I think we need to understand the cycle of the policy and how policy is made. Because sometimes as scientists we can uh, bear a responsibility which is a little bit bigger than us and we just summarize what we are doing in the word convince policymakers. And I think that it is not about convincing policymakers but it is about understanding how the policy is done and being there when it is uh, necessary. So basically, if we want to think about where we should be, we need to understand that in terms of policy, we have three streams. We have the problem stream, the politics stream, and the policy stream. You talked about uh, uh, materials as problem stream, and you talked about climate change and carbon and net zero carbon as problem stream. So now, what do we need to do to convince? We need to have a, 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 a policy window. So what is the policy window? The policy window is the good place to convince policymakers. And the policy window is when these three streams cross together, cut cross together, which means we have the problem, we have the policy, and we have the politics that agree on taking a solution. This happens mainly in the crisis. When a crisis happens, we have this. Um, have there been any meteorological crisis before? Yeah. Okay, any of our policymakers have seen it before? Are you sure? Oh, <laughs> I'm not sure because I have never seen it. But anyways, if you, are, if you are able to convince that this is a crisis, you can find a way. <laughs> yeah, but we are not taking decisions based on movies because we have priorities. As for decarbonization, so when talking about solutions, what we can do is to simulate and use models, and models are uncertain. So we will say, as scientists, and, and lots of people trust scientists because we believe we say the truth. We say the truth based on what we do have as results. We use the model, we can show that this solution is, is efficient but then we cannot know until trying the solutions. So now we are talking about decarbonization as effective solution. Yes, I can say yes, but I will show you the narrative. And I remember, and this is just to, yeah, just this something I, I like to share. When we had COVID and I was working with one of my colleagues in the team, and we wanted to model what will happen about greenhouse gases, and you were look, looking for models and trying to make it work, my, uh, my colleague told me, Kenza, I think we need to wait 500 years to see what will happen for the greenhouse gases, really. So this is exactly the, the thing. We have models, we have uncertainties, we are not sure, we need to try so that we can know if it works. Yes, yeah, yeah, just a last comment, and I don't want to take more time from, from other uh, people, but this is, I would like to take the opportunity because the audience here you would like to them to aware about the climate change because this is the next generation of our maybe leaders and, and, and also in the future leaders. But my point I brought that we have also to be careful about other things that impacting or they're going to make some catastrophe on our planet. Because all what we are talking about today is how to protect our planet. But there are some things that we cannot see today, but as some astrophysicists, some astronomers are working on this, we know that there's another danger that can be, can be, can be uh, hard on the Earth. It's the impact of the asteroids. And today, um, 
I'm involved with doing different projects with NASA and ESA. We're trying to do some best solution, but the world, they're not listening to us because they're just focusing on the climate change and they don't think that one day an asteroid can hit the Earth and the life is gone. Bye. So we should be also making the awareness to the, our public. So the climate change is good, but there's other things that is not under our control. For example, talking about the climate, it's our control, but this thing is out of control. But today, we have the solution and the technology to try and to protect ourselves as much as we can. 100% right. So maybe as scientists, you need to work more on this and give more solid narratives. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Okay, we still have questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I wanted to ask the panel what they think would be the impact of uh, cheap solar panels and cheap batteries, especially in Africa in terms of climate change, given that uh, the, the, the price of these panels has gone down very much and the price of the batteries is still high but is also going down exponentially. And for Africa, it would seem like an almost perfect solution given that there is a lot of sun and not much of a centralized energy production. So if every house would have its own solar panel and battery, that might solve a lot of problems. I'll take a quick shot at it. The simple answer is it will be enormously helpful. Um, like you mentioned, you don't have to worry about the grids or you can have microgrids. Second, you actually can store energy. Third, right now the expectation of people is not as huge as in many of the countries. So, for example, in India, people are not surprised not to have electricity for a few hours a day. So it's not like in America where everything goes to, ha um, sorry, everything stops if there's power outage for one minute. People are much more adaptable. So the solution of batteries, solar, and any other kind of storage on for transportation would be extremely helpful for climate and air quality. Thank you. Um, hello. Thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Uh, I have a question. I am a student here in UM6B. As a healthcare management student, considering the intersection of climate change and healthcare, how can proactive climate policies contribute to better healthcare management policies? Thank you. I can try to answer. Uh, this was mentioned by Ravi in his presentation that uh, we have uh, a number of atmospheric constituents that are active both on the climate and on the air quality side, and it's mostly the particles, but also the ozone. And so uh, you can, when you are actually trying to uh, reduce emission of uh, the, uh, or improve the efficiency of uh, cars, for example, you're decreasing both the emissions of uh, substances that are harmful for the climate and for the health. So basically, the improvement of uh, technologies, they usually go in the same way. A car will produce less CO2 and will, will produce less NOx and will produce less uh, emissions of uh, black carbon, which is uh, also a constituent that will affect climate and, and air quality. So basically, most or a number of uh, technology-driven solutions there are solutions for both sides of the, the, same, the same environmental issue, which is changes in the environment, changes for uh, improvement for the climate and improvement for the health. There are, however, some uh, methane you know, is, another, is another example. If you, when you decrease methane, uh, you're also going to decrease to make uh, improvements for the air quality and because methane will induce a number of reactions that at the end may produce uh, co co substances that are harmful for your health. So there is a number of, uh, of uh, technology run solutions that are actually good for both climate and air policy. I think we, we really need to, to go for those solutions. It's a little bit more complex than that because you have 
also uh, for the particles. So the particles, they are uh, the tiny substances that we have in, uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, they play a, a role that is a bit more complex uh, than just uh, the, the, uh, the being uh, an agent for the climate because they can actually both uh, warm the atmosphere and cool the atmosphere depending on the type of, uh, of, uh, of particles. So to answer your question in a simple way, yes, there are a number of solutions where you improve both sides, air quality and climate, but you have to be a bit careful because there are also some solutions that will deteriorate climate and for improving air quality and vice versa. Thank you. I don't know if we still have questions. Okay. Okay, so my last question is uh, what are your advices for young researchers uh, in not only in air quality but uh, also in all the fields because here in the UM6P there are a lot of uh, student researchers. What could be your advices for someone who wants to make a good career like uh, yours? Thank you. Could you repeat the question please? Okay, okay I, can, I can start. The question perhaps. is, yeah. Yeah. what do you advise for students who want to do a good career in issue related to climate? Thank you. Let me, let me just say one point, and my colleagues will say more about it. If, you know, the last 20 years has been about understanding the problem and projecting what it could become. I think we know that today. What we don't know is how to solve it. And so we need to really focus on methodologies to mitigate emissions, but also, number two, to adapt to some climate change that is unavoidable, and perhaps to start thinking about climate engineering if we are able to do it in an ethical way that is acceptable. And that's a big issue. So there is a lot of space to look at all these solution issues. And I think that's the career for two or three decades. And if I can complete, I would say uh, that um, with three things. The first is related to the discussion this morning about community intelligence. I think it is fundamental in, uh, when you're a young scientist to see where is your community and to connect with this community. It has been, it's not a, I suppose our career is not one person, it's a, it's a community that work together. So you have to make sure that you engage a community and I would say that now with the complexity of the problems that you have to solve, the community is not only with the atmospheric scientists, it's much wider than that. And then I will go to Kenza's presentation. There are, you are in Morocco and you are in Africa. And I think there are challenges that will be solved based on a global improvement of knowledge, but also on a knowledge of the local specificities. And it cannot be done, solutions cannot be always global, they have to be local, they have to be regional. And so I think my advice would be to make sure that you have the right regional and local communities extending to philosophers, uh, social scientists that work on with, to the, towards the same objectives. Yeah, and uh, also I want complete. So Paolo gave the starting point, and I will I will tell you that you need to start to complete with the end point. Start with an end in mind. So if you will start with the collaborative knowledge model, considering your whole community, consider also to know where are you heading towards. I work with many PhD students, and I I can just say 100% that uh, many of them don't know why they are doing the PhD 
and what what is the the, the, the result, what is the benefit for, for their societies and even for their lives. So they can think about the career, but which career by the end. So if I have something to tell you is please start with an end in mind. What, where, where I am going, what will happen. We talked about maybe prospective vision, what can happen in the future that will find me there. Something I always like to tell my students is that the world doesn't bear stupid people. So the world is running and you need to be running like way uh, before. The world needs to find you already there. So start with an end in mind with a prospective vision and, and, and you will be where you want. Thank you for your advices. And uh, unfortunately we are in the end of our session. Um, I wanna thank I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, I'm Paulson, I'm a PhD student at the African Research Center on Air Quality and Climate. So I have a question for Dr. Kenza. I've been, I, I was interested when you said you were also interested on the linkage between uh, the scientists on one side and the policy maker on the other side. So I'm curious to learn, what challenge have you identified uh, during that experience? And uh, what was the gap and how, uh, based on your experience, is one of the approach to, to address it, to tackle such a gap? Thank all, you. All the challenges you can imagine. <laughs> Especially because scientists, we have our language, which is not necessarily understood by the policy makers. Yeah, and I will stand up for this answer. Yeah. Um, one of the things we need, uh, so I will tell you that all the challenges are there. Uh, we have difference in speed. Uh, policymakers are running, we are not running, you see? So we have difference in language, we have difference in the, per in, 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 the, in the reason, in the purpose. Many scientists, and I think that this is something we need to deal with. Many scientists work for having papers, and policymakers are working for other objectives. So when we have difference in objectives, this is a main challenge that will create lots of other challenges. And as we, so this is, this is the answer to your question. The main challenge is the difference in the purposes. Now how we can solve this, what you are doing is amazing. What, the fact that you are here, you are hearing from different people, we are discussing this. This is a wonderful starting point. And we have talked about community go to policymakers, and one of the most important thing, stop saying that we are doing everything but nobody is hearing us. No. Because if you want to do something, it's your responsibility to do it. It is not the other who needs to hear you. You need to be there and you need to be ready when they will need you. When COVID happened, and again, here we had the policy window. We had these three streams that crossed cuts. When COVID happened, everybody started to look for scientists. What did the science say? And I, I was asked by the ministry, give us something about science. What, what was happening? So the, the idea is to be ready when they will need you. And I would say that unfortunately, I didn't see a ready science till now. Does this answer your question? Thank you. So, we are in the end of our session, and I want to thank again Mr. Guy Brasseur, Ravi Shankara, Paolo Lage, and of course, Kenza Khomsi. It was a great honor to have you with us today in the UM6P, and uh, of course, the UM6P Science Week. And they want to also thank you for your presence, and see you uh, in the next session. Back to you, Manel. Thank you so much, Iman. Give it up for Iman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you to all our esteemed speakers. What a wonderful session. Thank you so much. That was really enlightening. Um, thank you all for your presence with us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without a further ado, for our last session of the day, I really invite you to stay with us because you do not want to miss this one, OK? Allow me for this last session to switch to French. There are over 2,000 languages spoken 
uh, in Africa. So we are embracing our cultural diversity also this week. Nous allons conclure cette première journée, mesdames et messieurs, avec une très belle session intitulée Introduction to No Nonsense Sustainable Energy. Nous allons poursuivre les échanges sur les différentes transitions auxquelles nous faisons face, et notamment la transition énergétique. I'd like just to remind you all that headsets are available for you, ladies and gentlemen. If you need a headset and it's not available, just raise high your hand and someone from the team will help. I can see one lady here just in the front. Team Tech, if you could bring a headset for her, please. Or you can just help yourself. There are so many on the first stage, just to make it quicker for you, okay? So please stay with us. Live translation is available. This is a wonderful session. You do not want to miss it. I'll give you just a couple seconds more to grab your headsets and um, set them for a translation, live translation from, English, from French to English. Pour nous parler du sujet, mesdames et messieurs, j'ai le plaisir donc d'accueillir sur scène Monsieur Gilles Spenelauer et Monsieur Mohamed Zaki. Bienvenue à vous, messieurs. C'est un grand plaisir de vous avoir parmi nous. Et je vais d'abord, nous allons écouter vos présentations, si vous le permettez, puis nous ouvrirons les questions au public. Je suis sûr qu'il y aura plein de questions. Je rappelle aussi qu'il y a des gens qui nous écoutent et qui nous regardent sur YouTube. Je viens de vérifier. Euh, et ils sont nombreux. Et je vais commencer par vous, Monsieur Zaki. Vous êtes ingénieur et économiste diplômé de Polytechnique et Ponts et Chaussées. Vous êtes notamment passé euh, euh, par euh, Coin et Bélier et Total Energy. Vous étiez aussi président de OCP International et vous êtes aujourd'hui membre de l'UM6P Ventures. Bienvenue à vous, Monsieur, et euh, nous écoutons votre présentation. surtout des sujets euh, qui, qui, à mon avis, euh, permettent de peut-être bien cerner la question de la transition énergétique. Et comme je disais, euh, il est important sur ces sujets-là de, de, de savoir un peu la taille de chacun de ces objets, de ce, de ce, de ce que l'on essaie, les sujets que l'on essaie d'aborder. Et euh, la, la, la première question... Euh, que l'on doit se poser en tant qu'ingénieur, c'est quel est le problème que l'on essaie de résoudre Bon, j'essaie de... Ça, c'est la première slide. Je voulais juste vous dire que il y a euh, le professeur David McKay de l'Université de Cambridge qui a rédigé un livre très intéressant et très structuré. Euh, C'est un livre d'accès libre euh, et qui, à mon avis, est probablement le professeur qui a le mieux planté le décor en ce qui concerne euh, la transition énergétique. Donc, à l'occasion, allez-y sur euh, Internet, vous, vous trouverez le livre, vous verrez. C'est vraiment très riche et très didactique, comme d'habitude, les, les, les grands professeurs euh, sont capables de le faire. Alors, ce que je voulais dire, c'était euh, la partie la plus difficile au début, c'est d'essayer de bien cerner quel est le problème qu'on essaie de résoudre. Et euh, là, j'ai marqué au, au début, euh, les gens, et beaucoup de gens disent, euh, pour résoudre le problème euh, de, des émissions euh, de gaz à effet de serre, euh, bien une solution, on arrête d'utiliser les énergies fossiles. Point. Bon, sans se rendre compte que euh, ce n'est pas si simple que cela. Et puis, récemment, quand il y a eu la guerre entre la Russie et l'Ukraine, et que la Russie a décidé euh, de ne plus envoyer autant de gaz que ce qu'elle faisait avant, euh, on a vu en Europe euh, comment les gens euh, se sont battus pour essayer d'avoir du gaz qui venait d'autres parties du monde, que euh, beaucoup de pays sont revenus vers du charbon qui était encore plus polluant, et que ces sujets-là, euh, devenu deuxièmement, au, au deuxième plan dans le, le, les nécessités qu'avaient que, qu ces pays pour résoudre le problème de l'énergie sur le court terme. Donc, c'est important de bien comprendre que le sujet est certes non pas euh, réduire euh, ou arrêter euh, les énergies fossiles, parce que ça c'est quasiment impossible sur le court terme ou même sur le moyen terme, parce que ce sont des énergies qui ont pris leur place euh, au bout euh, de plusieurs dizaines d'années 
pour le charbon ou pour le pétrole et pour le gaz, c'est entre 100 ans, 250 années, 200 ans. Donc c'est quelque chose où la chaîne logistique a été mise en place, les innovations ont été mises en place pendant tout ce temps-là. Et donc c'est quelque chose qui est très ancré. Et ce n'est pas si facile que ça, de pouvoir juste sortir des énergies fossiles. La deuxième... La question que l'on peut se poser, qui est peut-être plus facile à aborder, est de dire qu'il faut que l'on réduise les émissions des gaz, des gaz à effet de serre. Ça, c'est déjà un problème qui est probablement mieux posé, qui n'est pas facile non plus. Euh, tout à l'heure, euh, on a entendu parler, euh, peut-être que pour les, les villes, passer aux voitures électriques, euh, ce serait une, une bonne chose, parce que ça permettrait d'avoir moins de pollution. Euh, certes, mais euh, si vous êtes dans un pays comme la Norvège où l'électricité vient de l'hydraulique et que vous utilisez de l'énergie électrique propre, oui, vous avez diminué les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Si vous êtes en Pologne et que l'électricité que, que, que vous utilisez vient du charbon, en réalité, vous émettez plus de gaz à effet de serre que si vous utilisiez directement une voiture, une Toyota hybride qui consomme 5 litres au 100. Ça, c'est un des, des sujets importants. Euh, on aurait voulu avoir avec nous aujourd'hui le, le professeur euh, Gaulier euh, de euh, l'école de Toulouse qui aurait pu présenter, un, un, beaucoup mieux que moi, ces genres d'interactions, euh, ce que peut faire l'État ou ce que l'on est en train d'essayer de faire que les gens changent leur comportement, de, de s'assurer que l'argent que met l'État pour ces changements est bien utilisé et de ramener ça justement au taux de CO2 qui est réduit par l'argent euh, public que l'on met sur la table. Et il donne quelques exemples où on voit à quel point euh, les États gaspillent de l'argent parce qu'ils mettent beaucoup d'argent sur des euh, sujets, sur des thèmes qui n'ont pas autant d'impact finalement sur les émissions de CO2. Donc ça, c'était un peu la, mon introduction. Euh, un, c'était de dire, bon, il faut bien se poser le problème. Et, et évidemment, euh, moi, je suis ingénieur et, et les ingénieurs aiment bien les problèmes. Et une fois que le problème vient posé, on aime bien réfléchir quels sont les éléments que l'on peut faire pour essayer de le résoudre. Et je voulais aussi euh, tuer une idée qui est fausse, mais qui est souvent avancée et, à partir des années... Euh, en fait, ça a été avancé la première fois en 1970 par un rapport du Club de Rome qui expliquait que pour le pétrole, on n'en avait plus que pour 30 ans. Euh, C'était en 1970. En 2000, euh, 30 ans après, non seulement il y avait toujours du pétrole, mais malgré tout ce que l'on avait consommé comme pétrole, il y en avait encore plus en réserve. Et depuis, entre 2000 et 2020, on a continué bien sûr à produire, à consommer du pétrole, mais aussi à en trouver de plus en plus. Les dernières grandes découvertes ont été, bien, bien entendu, quelques-unes dans le deep offshore, et donc tout Suriname, la Guyane, mais aussi aux États-Unis, dans euh, les oil shale, euh, et aussi euh, des découvertes ont été faites euh, offshore de l'Afrique du Sud, euh, en Mamini aujourd'hui. Donc, il faut voir qu'on ne sortira pas du pétrole parce qu'il n'y a plus de pétrole. Parce que il va y en avoir, et puis chaque fois que le prix monte, on met beaucoup d'argent dans l'exploration et on en trouve encore plus. On, on sortira du pétrole parce qu'on considérera que cette énergie, quand on l'utilise, elle émet du gaz à effet de serre qui est nuisible pour la planète. Et l'exemple un peu euh, rapide de dire « on n'est pas sorti de l'âge de pierre parce qu'il n'y avait plus de pierre euh, », ce sera la même chose pour le pétrole. À un moment donné, on va arrêter de consommer comme on le consomme aujourd'hui, parce qu'il euh, faut aussi voir un peu le, le, les notions de taille. Aujourd'hui, le monde consomme un peu plus de 100 millions de barils jour. Et ça augmente. Toutes ces dernières années, chaque fois, ça augmente de 1 à 1,5 million de barils jour. 100 millions de barils jour, peut-être une image. Hein. Un, un baril, c'est 159 litres, et, et c'est un baril, il fait 80 cm de hauteur, et, et il fait un peu... 37 ou 40 cm de, de diamètre. Si vous mettez tous ces barils les uns à côté des autres, vous pouvez faire le tour de la Terre au niveau de l'équateur. Donc, chaque jour, on remplit tous ces tonneaux et on les vide. 
Parce que, évidemment, il y a la consommation. C'est de ça, ce dont on est en train de parler, quand quelqu'un dit on veut sortir des énergies fossiles, on veut sortir du pétrole. C'est ces volumes-là. Et là, il faut bien le comprendre que ce n'est certainement pas avec des petites choses que l'on va arriver à changer une chaîne aussi importante et aussi longue et sur laquelle le génie humain a travaillé pendant presque deux siècles pour la rendre utile. Donc je vais parler un peu au début euh, sur un, un focus sur les grands pays, euh, et bon, surtout les états unis la Chine et puis un, un peu sur le Maroc, pour parler un peu de comment est utilisée l'énergie dans son ensemble. Après je parlerai un peu du sujet de McKay et puis je dirai quelque chose un peu sur le way forward. Alors cette planche, euh, je voulais la présenter, c'est les états unis euh, d'aujourd'hui, 2022, et euh, c'est bien parce que la, la consommation annuelle d'énergie, elle est de 100 quad, donc ça permet, quand on voit les chiffres, c'est déjà les pourcentages. Sur la partie de gauche, vous voyez les sources d'énergie. Et, et la première chose que vous pouvez voir, quelles sont les grandes sources d'énergie aujourd'hui utilisées aux États-Unis, c'est, et de loin, euh, le pétrole qui est aussi une ressource locale. Les États-Unis produisent le pétrole qu'elles consomment. Après, la deuxième, vous avez le, le gaz. Et c'est la même chose. Les États-Unis sont un grand producteur de gaz et un grand consommateur de gaz. Et puis même, on l'a vu, quand il y a eu des problèmes en Europe aussi, un exportateur de gaz. La troisième, c'est le charbon. Et avec ça, vous avez donc les trois sources d'énergie fossile qui correspondent à 80% de l'énergie consommée dans un pays tel que les états unis Toujours la même chose, ce que j'essaie de vous faire passer comme message, c'est que quand on dit on veut sortir des énergies fossiles pour avoir moins d'émissions de gaz à effet de serre, le sujet, il, est, il y a un problème d'échelle. Et ça ne va pas se faire en, en 10 ans. C'est vraiment un travail de fond qui va prendre du temps, qui va prendre beaucoup de qui va avoir besoin de beaucoup d'innovation, qui va avoir besoin de beaucoup d'énergie, de beaucoup d'argent, parce que les autres énergies dont on parle sont toutes des énergies où il va falloir investir à nouveau sur toute la chaîne, sur la logistique. Donc le, euh, ce qui est devant nous, c'est des grands chantiers, donc c'est énormément d'opportunités, bien sûr pour les, les, les sciences, parce qu'il faut trouver de nouvelles manières, aussi pour les techniciens, aussi pour les investisseurs, parce que tout ça va se passer sur les, les prochaines décennies. Donc j'ai parlé de la partie gauche. Après, on peut regarder les grands pôles de consommation que l'on voit ici. Donc tout à fait en bas, c'est tout ce qui concerne le transport. Et vous voyez qu'aux États-Unis, bah, le transport, c'est quand même beaucoup essentiellement lié au pétrole. Tout à fait en haut, il y a un autre truc qui est très intéressant, qui est la génération électrique. Et dans la génération électrique, on voit que le charbon est très très important. Et ça, c'est une caractéristique qui est de par le monde. C'est-à-dire aujourd'hui, l'électricité produite dans le monde à 74% vient du charbon. Parce que le charbon est souvent une ressource qui existe dans beaucoup de pays. Et c'est très difficile dans un pays qui a ses propres ressources euh, de ne pas les utiliser quand il a besoin euh, d'électricité. La deuxième source importante pour l'électricité aux États-Unis, c'est le gaz. Et au fait, c'est une ressource qui prend de plus en plus la place du charbon dans la génération électrique et qui aussi prend, même sur certains, pays, sur certains États des États-Unis, une place qu'avait le charbon avant. Et au-delà, il y a le nucléaire qui, pendant toutes ces dernières années, n'a presque pas bougé aux États-Unis. Si ce n'est, euh, je crois qu'il y a trois semaines, il y a la première centrale euh, de Géorgie, une centrale nucléaire qui vient d'être euh, connectée. Euh, mais c'est quelque chose qui est euh, très difficile à mettre en place. Bien sûr, c'est de l'électricité propre, mais c'est aussi une électricité. C'est aussi euh, une, euh, des projets qui sont très difficiles à mener à terme parce que c'est des projets qui durent longtemps et les lois et la réglementation changent pendant que vous êtes en train de construire. C'est-à-dire que cette centrale de Géorgie a commencé la construction et puis il y a eu 
euh, Fukushima, donc euh, l'accident qui a fait qu'il a fallu repenser un tas de choses, parce que bien entendu, on apprend des accidents qui se passent, donc il y a eu un tsunami, il y a eu des effets, donc il a fallu changer un tas de choses. Et après, il y a eu des histoires liées au terrorisme qui faisaient qu'il fallait que la cuve euh, respecte ou accepte euh, un avion qui tombe dessus. Donc, euh, ça aussi, ça a fait qu'il a fallu rechanger un tas de choses. Et grosso modo, euh, entre le prix initial prévu pour la, centrale pour la centrale nucléaire et le prix réel que ça a coûté, c'était quelque chose comme huit fois plus cher. Ça, c'est le côté pour le nucléaire qui est un peu négatif, que le prix augmente. Mais ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est que quand même, pour pouvoir payer cette centrale nucléaire, même si elle a coûté très très cher, il suffit que pour la vente d'électricité dans euh, l'état de Géorgie, on augmente de 5% le prix de l'électricité pour le consommateur. Et ça permet de payer la centrale. Dernier point sur cette slide. Je suis un peu long sur la slide, mais parce qu'elle permet un peu de, de, de montrer les, les grands éléments. Euh, il faut regarder euh, ce qui est en, en noir foncé et ce qui est en gris. Ce qui est en noir foncé, c'est quand on utilise l'énergie, la partie qui est utile. Et ce qui est en gris, c'est celle qui est perdue, donc sous forme de chaleur. C'est donc de l'énergie qui est gaspillée. Et vous pouvez tout de suite voir qu'en gros, aujourd'hui, dans l'énergie que l'on utilise, il y a euh, presque 70% qui est gaspillé. D'où le concept de l'efficacité énergétique. C'est-à-dire que ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est marginal, c'est quelque chose qui touche euh, 70% de ce que l'on gaspille. Euh, alors l'autre partie qui est aussi euh, qui est surprenante, c'est dans l'électricité, quelle est la partie qui est gaspillée Et là c'est encore plus. Et ça c'est la difficulté qui est liée au fait qu'aujourd'hui l'électricité ne peut pas se stocker. Et donc ça, malheureusement, l'électricité c'est propre, mais comme on ne peut pas la stocker et que comme souvent on ne sait pas à quel moment on va voir la demande, parce que si la demande dépasse la production, en général tout le système tombe en panne, on est tout le temps obligé de produire jusqu'à 20% de plus que ce qu'on nous demande pour être sûr de ne pas faire tomber tout le système. Donc, sur cette première slide, c'était un peu les, les, les sujets que je voulais vous montrer. C'est comment utiliser aujourd'hui l'énergie dans un pays comme les États-Unis, un grand pays donc consommateur d'énergie. Si je passe maintenant à la Chine, j'ai les chiffres de la Chine de 2017 parce que le Lawrence National Laboratory n'a pas fait des, des chiffres plus récents. Mais entre 2017 et 2023, la Chine consomme encore plus d'énergie. Mais la structure reste à peu près la même. Et là, ce que l'on voit tout de suite sur la Chine, c'est par exemple, bon, le pétrole, elle a une partie qui est importée. Mais la deuxième chose, c'est l'importance du charbon. Et ça, le charbon, pour l'électricité et pour l'industrie. Et au fait, quand la Chine se développe, comme vous le savez, sur ces dernières années, la Chine est devenue un peu l'usine du monde, puisque beaucoup de pays préféraient acheter des produits directement de Chine plutôt que de les fabriquer chez eux. Bon, bah, si la Chine fabrique, bah, elle consomme plus d'énergie et il y a plus d'effets de gaz à effet de serre dans le pays. La Chine est aussi celui qui a les plans les plus audacieux pour les énergies renouvelables et pour le nucléaire. Euh, la Chine... C'est aussi le pays qui, au point de vue euh, euh, recherche et développement, euh, a fait un effort euh, extraordinaire pour fabriquer des panneaux solaires euh, très efficaces à un prix qui bat toute la concurrence. Euh, et ça, le professeur Gaulier n'est pas avec nous. Et je pense que certainement, si nous avions le professeur Gaulier, il, il aurait expliqué comment est-ce que des décisions de l'Allemagne de subventionner euh, la production euh, d'électricité solaire en Allemagne, en demandant donc euh, aux sociétés euh, allemandes d'acheter l'électricité quand vous mettez des panneaux solaires chez vous. Ça a incité beaucoup de gens à mettre des panneaux solaires, beaucoup d'entreprises, parce que quelqu'un allait vous l'acheter à un prix qui est raisonnable, et que ceci a eu comme effet, euh, finalement, euh, d'acheter des panneaux qui venaient euh, de Chine, au même moment où on a vu la Chine donner de l'argent dans les universités pour la recherche, donner de l'argent pour développer des panneaux de plus en plus efficaces et moins chers, 
et ce qui a finalement amené une situation où les subventions données par l'Allemagne finissaient dans les centres de, des universités et les centres de recherche chinois et améliorer globalement la situation pour la Chine. Il nous reste quelques minutes pour clôturer, comme ça on peut écouter M. Gilles Spenelauer. M. Zaki, si vous souhaitez peut-être conclure votre présentation, je vois qu'il y a des questions dans la salle, et on poursuivra avec vous aussi dans les questions. Je vous en prie, prenez quelques minutes pour conclure, si vous restez des messages à faire passer, sinon on passera aux questions. Non, non, je, euh, je vais arrêter. Bien sûr, j'ai quelques idées que je voulais faire passer, mais je pense qu'à travers les questions et réponses, je pourrais vous répondre. Euh, mais je suis là et je suis bien sûr toute la semaine avec vous à votre disposition. Vous pouvez aussi me poser des questions dans le couloir. Absolument, on poursuivra avec vous. Merci infiniment, Monsieur Merci. Zaki. Je vous invite à reprendre place. Nous euh, allons poursuivre donc euh, avec Monsieur Gilles Spenlauer. Vous avez obtenu un doctorat en biopharmacie euh, et en chimie, en travaillant sur le ciblage des médicaments avec des polymères euh, biodégradables. Vous avez ensuite occupé des postes de recherche et de développement en France, aux états unis en Angleterre, euh, notamment au sein du groupe euh, L'Oréal, où vous avez dirigé la recherche avancée mondiale. Et euh, vous avez été aussi l'un des premiers cofondateurs de L'Oréal Ventures pour transformer son portefeuille de matières premières en un portefeuille vert et renouvelable. Votre sujet touche aussi à l'énergie, je pense plus précisément à la chimie, qui est l'industrie des industries. Nous vous écoutons et puis on reviendra pour les questions. Merci beaucoup. Merci Manel, bonsoir à tous. Euh, oui, en fait, euh, on m'entend là, oui. Euh, ma, la question aujourd'hui que je voulais traiter, c'est à la suite de l'énergie, en aval de l'énergie, il y a une industrie qui est extrêmement importante, qui est l'industrie de la chimie. Aujourd'hui, l'industrie de la chimie, euh, c'est essentiellement une industrie qui est d'ordre pétrochimique. Et pour deux raisons. La première raison, c'est que l'énergie qui est utilisée par euh, l'industrie chimique, c'est essentiellement une industrie, une, une énergie de pétrole. Euh, et puis la deuxième raison, c'est que beaucoup des matières premières qui sont utilisées dans la chimie, c'est des matières premières qui sont produites au sein des raffineries. Donc, euh, évidemment, euh, puisqu'on parle aujourd'hui de transition, il m'a semblé important, euh, à la suite du, de la présentation sur la transition énergétique, de vous parler de quelque chose qui est finalement extrêmement concret, hein, ce n'est pas une valeur euh, euh, extensive comme l'énergie, c'est euh, des produits, et de vous parler donc de l'industrie chimique. Alors, la slide suivante, c'est moi qui la passe. Donc, la présentation, euh, c'est la transition euh, d'une chimie pétro-based à une chimie bio-based. Et vous allez voir que c'est une transition et qu'au fond, elle obéit un petit peu aux mêmes règles que toutes les transitions euh, dont on a parlé aujourd'hui. Alors, la chimie... Euh, ah, ah ben, c'est pas la bonne... Bon, écoutez, c'est pas grave, je vais me débrouiller avec ça. Ah, ah, ah. Euh, la, la chimie aujourd'hui, c'est, si vous lisez de droite à gauche, c'est d'abord euh, quasiment tous les produits qu'on utilise aujourd'hui. Hein. C'est euh, les produits de grande consommation, c'est le packaging, c'est les transports, c'est la construction, c'est l'agriculture, c'est les produits pharmaceutiques, et j'en oublie certainement. En tout cas, vous voyez sur le, le breakout là que c'est euh, des détergents, des, des cosmétiques, euh, des plastifiants, du plastique, euh, de la peinture, euh, c'est tout ça la chimie. Donc aujourd'hui, la chimie, c'est partout. Et même si on essaye de compter, et vous allez voir, c'est en fait un fond, un puissant fond, on ne sait pas aujourd'hui, en nombre, le type de produits chimiques qui sont produits dans le monde. On pense qu'il y a plus d'un million de produits chimiques donc d'un million de produits, de structures chimiques différents, produits dans le monde. À ça, vous ajoutez une, vous ajoutez une combinatoire qui est le mélange de produits chimiques, on est peut-être à 100 millions de, de différents produits qui sont vendus dans le monde. <rire> Aujourd'hui, c'est ce que Manel a repris, c'est qu'on estime que l'industrie chimique, c'est l'industrie des industries, c'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a aucune industrie dans le monde qui puisse se passer des produits chimiques. Et euh, pour revenir à la notion d'échelle qu'évoquait Suma Metsaki, euh, c'est partout, souvent ça aboutit entre les mains de nous autres, les consommateurs, 
donc important à le considérer, hein, que ce soit je suis agriculteur, j'utilise des, 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 des produits d'agrochimie, je suis médecin, je dispense des produits pharmaceutiques, je, suis, je bricole chez moi, je peins avec une peinture, c'est de la chimie. Euh, et il faut bien comprendre que ça, c'est vrai ici à Ben Guérir, mais c'est vrai à Paris, mais c'est vrai partout dans le monde. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, il y a un sujet d'échelle pour la chimie, c'est que la chimie est utilisée dans le monde entier. Et c'est important de comprendre cette échelle-là, parce que de la même manière que tout à l'heure, c'est Mohamed Zaki disait qu'on produisait un million de barils de pétrole par jour, donc je ne sais pas combien de tonnes ça fait, mais euh, dans un slide que je voulais vous présenter, euh, il faut comprendre que, par exemple, aujourd'hui, on produit par an 1, euh, 120 de tonnes de polyéthylène par an dans le monde. 120 millions de tonnes. On ne parle pas de petites quantités. Et alors, pour revenir à la slide de la transition, je suis désolé, je suis en train de refaire la présentation à l'endroit. Euh, ben, au fond, le sujet aujourd'hui, c'est la transition. Donc aujourd'hui, la transition, c'est partir d'une chimie qui est très largement très pétro-based. Vous allez voir, il y a à peu près 3% de la chimie qui est aujourd'hui non pétro-based, euh, qui est bio-based. Je vais vous montrer quelques exemples. Mais vous avez sur la... Donc, sur la, donc on passe de deux états, hein, du pétro-based au bio-based. C'est un changement d'état. On va suivre une courbe. Difficile de savoir la forme de cette courbe, mais moi j'étais un peu optimiste, hein, j'ai montré qu'il y avait une courbe d'apprentissage, et puis cette courbe descend rapidement, et puis euh, dans 20 ans, 30 ans, on sera à la bio-based chemistry, je suis optimiste. Euh, sur l'axe des ordonnées, vous avez finalement la pollution, hein, euh, les, les greenhouse euh, gas effects, euh, green gas euh, qui sont produits, mais j'aurais pu mettre en ordonnée la pollution, j'aurais pu mettre en ordonnée l'écotoxicité, j'aurais pu mettre en ordonnée le nombre de morts euh, prématurées à cause de la pollution et des particules. En fait, cet axe, c'est l'axe sur lequel on doit travailler et qu'on doit absolument diminuer. Et pour ce qui est de la chimie, on peut rajouter une autre chose sur cet axe, c'est la non-accumulation des produits que nous fabriquons aujourd'hui à travers euh, la pétrochimie. Il faut absolument que les produits qu'on fabrique, et c'est un peu la nouveauté par rapport à, à ce qui est généralement raconté, c'est qu'il faut qu'on produise aujourd'hui des produits qui soient non seulement pas toxiques, mais également dégradables. Et ça, en abscisse, vous avez le temps. Et au fond, le temps, on voit bien que euh, ça aussi, c'est une valeur extensive. On ne on peut pas le raccourcir, on ne peut pas l'augmenter, euh, mais le temps, ça sera le temps qu'il faudra pour réunir suffisamment de budget, de finances, de faire les investissements nécessaires. C'est aussi, euh, et c'est un grand sujet qui est évoqué euh, durant cette semaine, c'est la partie sociologique. Comment renforcer l'acceptance de la part des publics, des populations à la nécessité de se transformer et de s'engager dans ce genre de, de non seulement de chimie, mais d'utilisation des bons produits. Alors, je ne vous parle pas de la chimie du pétrole, parce que je pense que vous avez compris ce que je voulais dire par là. Simplement un point, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, on estime que la, chi la, la chimie, euh, donc essentiellement pétrochimique aujourd'hui, c'est, dans ce qu'on est capable de compter, c'est 6% des gaz à effet de serre, mais tout le monde dit que ce chiffre est très très largement sous-estimé. On pense qu'on est au-delà de 10%. On doit être dans l'ordre de grandeur des, euh, des, des gaz à effet de serre produits par les industries métallurgiques ou l'industrie du ciment. On est à peu près dans cet ordre de grandeur-là. Donc c'est un gros morceau euh, de la pollution aux gaz à effet de serre. Il y a un impact sur le public, ceci dit, qui est très important. Parce qu'on voit bien qu'à travers euh, les discussions qui se produisent dans les différents endroits du monde, euh, tout le monde comprend qu'aujourd'hui, la pollution devient un problème. D'abord, la pollution devient visible. En, ensuite, on entend des, des commentaires qu'on a entendus tout à l'heure sur les mortalités prématurées dues à la pollution. Les gens et le public, en général, comprennent beaucoup mieux ce que ça veut dire que la toxicité humaine, 
Je vous rappelle quand même les polémiques autour d'utilisation des bisphénols. Le bisphénol dans le monde, la production de bisphénol dans le monde, c'est plus de 500 millions de tonnes. Là encore une fois, vous vous rendez compte des échelles de, de produits dont on parle comme ça au travers d'un article dans un journal. Le bisphénol, c'est ça. Les microplastiques, je ne vous raconte pas. Vous voyez bien que sur les plages, euh, sur l'Atlantique, vous voyez tous ces monceaux de, de bouteilles en plastique, de fabricants de, de shampoing ou de, de, de desktop divers. Euh, vous voyez aussi dans les champs euh, les sacs en plastique euh, qui sont arrêtés par les branches des, des buissons. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, le... La conscience de la pollution liée aux produits chimiques, elle est devenue relativement aiguë et chacun la comprend dans sa vie au quotidien. Les régulateurs, les policy makers s'en sont saisis, les scientifiques aussi. Et aujourd'hui, on demande aux, aux scientifiques et aux, aux industries de travailler sur trois axes. On leur dit, bon, euh, déjà, commencez à fabriquer euh, et à réutiliser euh, les matériaux que vous produisez. Donc c'est le fameux recyclage. Ensuite, il y a un sujet, et c'est ça, à mon avis, le sujet le plus important pour répondre aux commentaires qu'a fait euh, M. Zaki. On n'a pas, pas quitté l'âge de pierre parce qu'on manquait de pierre, on ne quittera pas le pétrole parce qu'on manque de pétrole. On quittera le pétrole parce qu'on aura, on aura trouvé des moyens de transformer la chimie afin qu'elle fabrique moins de gaz à effet de serre. Donc cet enjeu-là, en gros, c'est un enjeu d'innovation. Et je vais vous montrer, il y a des tas de solutions qui existent déjà, mais je pense qu'on peut aller encore un peu plus loin dans l'innovation. Et euh, aujourd'hui, il y a aussi, et on a parlé d'efficacité tout à l'heure, mais aujourd'hui, euh, on peut encore gagner en efficacité sur tout un tas de procédés, euh, notamment en utilisant un, un peu plus de chimie euh, bio-based. Donc, la bio-based chemistry, la définition la plus simple, c'est remplacer euh, l'origine fossile euh, donc, euh, du pétrole ou du gaz par de la biomasse. Et l'idée, c'est euh, de fabriquer avec ces biomasses des plastiques, des textiles, du fuel, euh, enfin tout ce qu'aujourd'hui, la chimie, est capable de la chimie pétrole est capable de fabriquer. L'enjeu, c'est d'aller même plus loin. Et c'est là que l'innovation intervient. L'enjeu, c'est de faire de nouvelles molécules qui soient plus performantes et qu'on choisira plus que ce qu'on choisit aujourd'hui quand on achète une peinture, etc., qui est d'origine pétrole. En fait, il faut trouver des, une chimie qui soit bio-based et qui apporte de l'innovation par rapport à ce qui existe aujourd'hui en pétrochimie. C'est en fait comme ça qu'on gagnera la bataille. Donc je l'ai dit, le comment, mais je ne vais pas revenir trop là-dessus, mais le comment, c'est recycler, utiliser des matériaux renouvelables, et puis c'est contribuer, et la chimie peut faire beaucoup là-dedans, au développement d'une euh, économie circulaire, euh, soit en allant euh, recycler, je recherchais les bouteilles en plastique dans les dans les wastes, etc., mais également euh, pro proposer des matériaux qui soient dégradables et réutilisables. Alors, je vous disais tout à l'heure qu'il y a quelques pourcents de chimie qui est bio-based. Et là, je vous ai fait une liste de tous les matériaux, toutes les chimies qui sont aujourd'hui disponibles, achetées et qui sont fabriquées par des voies bio-based. C'est quelques pourcents des volumes, c'est très peu aujourd'hui, mais sachez que ça existe et sachez que c'est industriellement viable, c'est-à-dire que ça coûte moins cher de faire ces matériaux avec ces voies bio-based que de les faire à partir d'une pétrochimie. Donc il y a des moyens encore de faire mieux que la pétrochimie. Alors une bioraffinerie, hein, par analogie avec les, la raffinerie pétrole, ça ressemble à ça, c'est peut-être un peu moins bucolique, il y a quand même des camions, etc. Euh, L'idée, c'est d'utiliser, comme je l'ai dit, des biomasses, de faire fermenter ces biomasses, et puis d'utiliser des catalystes, des bio, ce qu'on appelle des biocatalystes, c'est très souvent, en vérité, des enzymes. Et euh, grâce à ça, un bon chimiste, il est capable de vous faire euh, de l'éthanol, de vous faire des polymères, de vous faire... Et j'ai vu tout à l'heure dans les stands euh, qu'il y avait... Euh, euh, derrière, il euh, y a des tas de gens euh, à, à l'UM6P euh, qui travaillent sur ces sujets-là. Donc, 
n'est pas des, des grandes nouveautés que je suis en train de vous dire là, mais ce que je veux dire par là, c'est qu'au final, euh, un chimiste, il est assez facilement capable de passer d'une innovation pétrochimique à une innovation bio-based. Un bon chimiste. Bon, euh, alors là, je passe euh, pour qu'on ait un peu de temps pour les questions. Je vais vous parler d'une plateforme qui est... Il me reste combien de temps, là Combien Deux. Alors, je vais vous parler d'une plateforme qui existe depuis très longtemps et dont sortent la plupart des produits que je vous ai montrés. C'est les plateformes sucre. Hein. Aujourd'hui, on fait du biodiesel, du bioéthanol. Le problème, c'est que ce n'est pas encore le summum de l'innovation parce qu'on fait beaucoup de drop-in. C'est-à-dire qu'en gros, on fabrique des produits pétrochimiques des fa... On fabrique avec ce système des produits qui sont également fabriqués à pétrochimie. Moi, je pense qu'il faut aller un cran plus loin et fabriquer des nouveaux produits. Et je vais conclure pour rester dans les deux minutes et laisser la question ouverte. Il faut bien comprendre que sur le plan philosophique, la chimie du pétrole, ça a plus de 100 ans. L'ammoniac, hein, euh, la réaction d'Aberbosch, ça a un peu moins de 100 ans. Donc, donnons 20 ans aux chimistes de Biobased pour améliorer leur système et ils vont y arriver. Euh, Aujourd'hui, ce qui est rassurant aussi, c'est que les gros chimistes, alors quand je parle de gros chimistes, hein, je parle de Solvay, je, je, je pense à BASF, je pense à Dow Chemical, ils ont des projections euh, ouvertes où ils expriment que sur les scopes 1 et 2, qui sont des scopes quand même importants, en 2050, ils seront à zéro émission de CO2. Donc, on peut les croire, de toute façon, ils ne le feraient pas de manière si ouverte s'ils ne pensaient pas qu'ils y arriveraient, parce que le backlash serait trop important pour leur survie, mais c'est pour vous dire que, malgré tout, les solutions qui sont aujourd'hui proposées et sur lesquelles un certain nombre d'entre vous travaillent sont des solutions viables et qui vont certainement apporter des résultats importants dans le futur. Maintenant, en 2050, est-ce que ça suffira pour enrayer les changements climatiques qu'on observe aujourd'hui et qui sont liés aux émissions de CO2 ça, c'est le grand point d'interrogation. En tout cas, moi, je n'ai pas la réponse. Et euh, ben, vous regarderez dans les slides, puisque les slides sont disponibles, mais euh, aujourd'hui, la chimie euh, décarbonisée, c'est euh, beaucoup théorisé, et notamment par les grands de la chimie. Donc, euh, euh, les engagements sont forts et, à mon avis, euh, euh, réalisables. Bon, je vais m'arrêter là, Merci. sans parler de l'ammoniac... Euh, du projet ammoniac et hydrogène de l'OCP, mais ça fait partie de ce démarche. Merci infiniment. Merci pour vos applaudissements, mesdames et messieurs. Merci beaucoup pour vos deux présentations. Nous allons maintenant prendre quelques questions du public. Si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas. Voilà, je vois une, des questions là, dans les premières rangées. S'il vous plaît, si on peut avoir un micro. Une première ici, puis une deuxième là. Merci. D'abord, je voudrais vous remercier, M. Zaki et votre monsieur, pour vos interventions. Ensuite, ma question, elle concerne l'efficacité énergétique. Ma question, c'est que globalement, il y a une tendance de, de volonté de passer à tout ce qui est renouvelable. Est-ce que c'est positif pour l'efficacité C'est-à-dire, est-ce que on a des moyens aujourd'hui d'améliorer de, de, ou bien d'optimiser l'efficacité pour les énergies renouvelables plus que pour les énergies pétrochimiques et, et des, des énergies fossiles, en fait. Merci. Vous souhaitez prendre la question maintenant, qu'on prenne deux, trois questions et ensuite vous répondez alors, de, la question, si je reformule, c'est d'un point de vue de l'efficacité énergétique. Est-ce que nous avons plus les moyens de le faire avec l'énergie renouvelable versus l'énergie fossile Après, je vous laisse peut-être euh, spécifier votre question. Non, non, mais... Alors, euh, entre l'énergie euh, renouvelable aujourd'hui, euh, si on parle de l'éolien et du solaire, comme vous savez, c'est intermittent. C'est-à-dire, il y a des régions 
dans le monde, par exemple, où on peut pendant dix jours ne pas avoir de soleil, pratiquement pas, et ne pas avoir de vent. Ça, c'est pour la production. Donc, c'est une production intermittente. En face, il y a la consommation. Et les gens, ils, ils veulent avoir l'énergie quand ils en ont besoin. Ils veulent l'électricité le soir, ils veulent euh, le matin. Pour pouvoir trouver la jonction entre les deux, il y a le stockage. Et aujourd'hui, euh, il y a plusieurs procédés de stockage et il y a beaucoup de recherches sur le stockage parce qu'on sait que c'est le stockage qui va vraiment permettre un grand développement des énergies renouvelables. C'est parce que ça va rendre l'énergie proche de, du besoin et de la consommation. L'autre chose que l'on a de manière intermédiaire, parce que je vous ai montré, euh, les chiffres sont impressionnants. Euh, Aujourd'hui, l'énergie solaire et l'énergie éolienne progressent. Elles ne progressent pas assez vite. Et elles ne progressent pas assez vite pour beaucoup de raisons. Une, euh, il faut beaucoup d'argent, beaucoup de capex. Euh, deux, il faut des endroits où on peut faire ça. Et il y a beaucoup de régions où les gens, ils ne veulent pas avoir une éolienne à côté de chez eux. Donc il y a tout un travail à, à faire avec euh, les réglementations, la politique. Donc le, ces deux énergies-là ne se développent pas aussi vite que ce qu'elles pourraient faire s'il si, euh, y avait des politiques plus positives pour pouvoir permettre d'avoir euh, un peu plus de champ. La deuxième partie, je disais, c'était euh, le stockage... Ou comment gérer cette intermittence ben, Il y a deux manières. Bien sûr, le stockage, les gens travaillent dessus. L'autre manière, c'est les centrales à gaz. Parce qu'une centrale à gaz, on peut la faire démarrer euh, à tout moment. Et donc, ça fait partie, dans beaucoup de pays, de ce qui permet d'avoir de l'énergie euh, renouvelable de plus en plus importante. Donc, c'est un peu ça ce qui fera que euh, on verra ces énergies arriver. Euh, mais il faut quand même, au vu de la taille, euh, moi, personnellement, je pense qu'on n'échappera pas à un développement plus important de l'énergie nucléaire. Parce qu'elle, elle produit de manière stable et sur une très longue période. Mais je sais qu'il y a des gens qui considèrent qu'il euh, ne faut absolument pas euh, parler du nucléaire pour le problème lié aux déchets, euh, pour le problème lié aux risques. Mais au vu de l'échelle globale euh, des demandes d'énergie, euh, je pense que euh, le nucléaire fait partie des solutions qui permettront d'avoir euh, une électricité euh, non carbonée. Très bien. Une autre ouais. question euh, Sincèrement, moi, je n'ai pas de question. Je voudrais simplement que Swam Zeki nous présente les, les figures pour le Maroc, parce que je suis vraiment abasourdi par le taux de perte et d'inefficacité que tu as présenté pour les états unis et la Chine. Tu ne m'as pas entendu, ce Mohamed non, pas entendu. À, à comparaison avec le Maroc, par rapport aux chiffres non, que vous avez tu... présentés concernant la Chine et les états unis en termes de déperdition énergétique, c'est bien cela non, je, je, Ce que je disais, je suis vraiment abasourdi par la proportion des pertes pour les Américains, pour les Chinois, et tu avais à nous présenter aussi des figures pour le Maroc. Si tu pouvais aussi nous, nous montrer ça. Ok. Euh, au fait, euh, tu sais, c'est le moteur thermique. C'est la thermo. C'est-à-dire, quand vous utilisez euh, de l'essence, euh, bon, en réalité, le rendement est de 30%. Euh, quand vous utilisez, par exemple, quand on génère de l'électricité à partir du gaz avec un cycle combiné, on arrive à monter jusqu'à 55%. Et c'est pour ça que le gaz prend de plus en plus de place pour la génération électrique. Mais on n'est on est jamais à 100%. Là où il y a vraiment le rendement et le meilleur, c'est pour les barrages. Parce que là, vous avez un potentiel, il y a de l'eau qui est en haut dans le barrage. Quand vous faites descendre l'eau, là, votre rendement, il est supérieur à 80%. Donc c'est par nature, c'est la thermodynamique qui fait qu'il y a beaucoup d'énergie qui est perdue euh, quand on l'utilise et qu'on passe de cette énergie à une puissance mécanique ou euh, à l'électricité. Euh, merci, c'était vraiment passionnant. Euh, juste 
petit point, il y a des questions, il y a, pardon, sur l'application la, Campus Plus, il y a déjà des demandes de rendez-vous euh, parce qu'il y a des gens qui veulent poursuivre la, les discussions avec vous. Je vous communiquerai le, leur nom. Et moi, j'ai juste une question. Vous avez parlé, Gilles a parlé tout à l'heure de, de l'innovation et de la, la, la possibilité de, 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 de créer de nouveaux produits plutôt que de produire les mêmes produits à partir d'un autre procédé. Et en fait, il y a une question qui, qui me taraude, c'est qu'à aucun moment on ne parle de, 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 du réel ajustement de, de notre consommation Est-ce que le fait de... de on, on, est, on a l'impression qu'on est toujours dans la même course, on essaie juste au lieu de, de faire quelque chose qui, qui est harmful some way aujourd'hui, de trouver quelque chose qui certainement aura d'autres conséquences négatives par la suite Alors, le, le réajustement de la consommation... Euh, c'est un vœu pieux. Euh, à Paris, à l'OCP, il y a un étudiant qui m'a posé une question peut-être encore plus directe. Il m'a dit euh, « Est-ce qu'il euh, ne faudrait pas faire de la décroissance ?» Vendre moins de produits... Euh, euh, moi, je pense que c'est un... Alors là, pour le coup, c'est un enjeu presque... C'est un enjeu sociologique, c'est-à-dire qu'on voit bien que dans un certain nombre de cas, les gens acceptent d'acheter moins ou bien d'acheter local. Mais quand il y a des affaires de marque ou de qualité, euh, moi je ne vais pas aller acheter euh, un ersatz d'Adidas euh, alors que je veux des baskets Adidas. Euh, c'est le genre de trade-off que les, la société ne fait pas. Alors, C'est pour ça que je dis que c'est un peu un vœu pieux, c'est-à-dire que euh, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, on est dans une société de consommation où il faut être efficace dans ce qu'on fait, etc. Et les gens dépensent. Euh, alors, ils vont accepter peut-être de prendre le train plutôt que de prendre une voiture à essence, des choses comme ça, mais euh, je pense qu'il y a une limite... Euh, malheureusement, dans euh, l'engagement euh, sociétal euh, sur, euh, sur la consommation. Mais peut-être que je me trompe, hein, c'est mon, mon point de vue. Maintenant, euh, euh, j'ai travaillé chez, chez L'Oréal. Euh, L'Oréal, euh, ils ne vont pas commencer à dire ben, « on va vendre moins de shampoing euh, ». Ce n'est pas, pas comme ça qu'ils prendront le, le sujet. Hein. Ils vont d'abord diminuer l'épaisseur des, des flacons pour qu'il y ait moins de pl plastique par flacon. Merci beaucoup. On peut encore prendre deux questions Oui, j'en vois ici euh, au milieu. Oui, allez-y, je vous en prie, vous aviez déjà le micro. Ok. Euh, juste, euh, merci beaucoup, merci pour votre présentation. Je voudrais juste revenir sur un graphe que vous avez montré qui montre euh, la diminution de la pollution, par exemple... Euh, lorsqu'on passe des produits des bio à des produits... Il faut se méfier parce que ce n'est pas toujours vrai. Euh, lorsque vous prenez juste un exemple, euh, lorsque vous prenez... Euh, vous allez au marché puis on vous demande si vous voulez euh, un sac en papier ou un sac en plastique. Euh, une analyse de cycle de vie montre clairement par exemple qu'un sac en plastique est moins endommageable pour l'environnement qu'un sac en papier. Donc il faut... Cet état de fait de toujours penser que bio est moins polluant, je pense qu'elle est absolument questionnable, dépendamment bien sûr de ce qu'on est en train de faire. C'est tout. C'est juste une remarque. Oui, et je, suis et je suis complètement d'accord. Je pense qu'il faut... Se... Bon, évidemment, là je présente, un... je présente euh, volontairement, c'est simpliste. Maintenant, dans le détail, euh, hein, le diable est dans, toujours dans le détail, il faut, il faut voir tout ça... Euh... Euh, et puis un papier euh, qui a été ancré avec des encres dans lequel il y a du plomb, etc. Il y a beaucoup de choses à dire. Mais euh, non, non, je suis d'accord. Je crois qu'après, il, il faut regarder chaque filière et c'est comme ça qu'il faut mesurer les choses et les, et les adresser. Oui. Euh, en ce qui concerne la consommation, il faut faire euh, attention à ce qu'on appelle la dématérialisation, c'est-à-dire que avec les technologies nouvelles, on a besoin de moins en moins de matières premières pour faire quelque chose. Et le meilleur exemple, c'est un smartphone qui remplace 
de douzaines de, de, de télévisions, ordinateurs, euh, vidéo recorders et tout ça, ça a remplacé tout ça dans un tout petit truc qui euh, n'utilise presque pas de matière première. Oui, tout, tout, tout à fait, hein, mais c'est pour, pour ça que quelque part, euh, c'est les limites de la technologie. Je crois que la technologie peut aider à, à faire tout un tas de choses, à être vertueuse dans son approche, etc. Mais ensuite, euh, c'est la manière dont ces technologies seront vendues, et ça sera aussi la manière dont les consommateurs utiliseront ces technologies. C'est-à-dire, euh, en effet, on peut très bien... Euh, euh, on peut très bien envisager des technologies type 5G, etc., qui soient beaucoup moins consommatrices, mais au final, si c'est pour que les gens utilisent cette technologie pour non plus regarder deux films par jour, mais dix films par jour, on va, on va se tirer une balle dans le pied. Donc, je pense que euh, il faut, la technologie apporte un certain nombre de solutions. Malheureusement, la technologie n'est pas tout. Et c'est dans l'emploi de cette technologie euh, que euh, on verra, euh, on pourra en fait réaliser ce qu'on cherche à obtenir, c'est-à-dire, par exemple, réduire les, les émissions à, de gaz à effet de serre. Euh, mais encore une fois, je crois qu'il faut faire assez, assez attention. C'est quand on fait une présentation, on plaque un certain nombre de modèles, mais après, chaque cas est à regarder dans le détail. Juste, juste si je peux dire un petit quelque chose sur votre gauche. Sur votre gauche. Voilà. Euh, donc finalement, je retiens quand même que euh, la technologie n'est certes pas tout, mais vous ne proposez pas moins de technologies, ce qu'on proposait dans les années 50, 60, 70, etc. Mais au contraire, à la limite, plus de technologie. C'est-à-dire que la question de la technologie, c'est la question de son usage et de son intensité, c'est-à-dire qu'est-ce qu'on fait, comment on le fait, etc. Mais il y a une deuxième question qui se pose, enfin je dirais plutôt, aujourd'hui on dirait plus un questionnement, quoi, parce que ça n'appelle pas forcément une réponse stricte, c'est que, euh, en deçà de la question technologique, effectivement il y a la question des usages de consommation qui a été évoquée euh, par, par, euh, par SAD, et vous dites vous n'êtes pas optimiste sur la transformation des usages de consommation de la consommation. Moi, j'aurais tendance à être un peu plus optimiste parce que je crois qu'il y a... Alors peut-être que c'est ma déformation de philosophe qui me fait réfléchir à ce genre de choses, mais je crois que, par exemple, si vous prenez juste une idée qui s'est développée, qui a eu énormément de conséquences et qui n'était pas une idée complètement... C'est l'idée de propriété exclusive depuis le XVIIe et le XVIIIe siècle. C'est une idée assez nouvelle, c'est-à-dire dans le monde féodal, la propriété exclusive, ça n'existe pas vraiment. Alors ça, 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 ça a des inconvénients, le système féodal avec un rapport au collectif, et puis le seigneur, etc. Mais la propriété exclusive, elle a engendré dans le droit français ce qu'on trouve, une définition de, de la propriété comme euh, usus, l'utilisation, l'usage ou la jouissance, du point de vue juridique. Euh, fructus, on peut en tirer des fruits, on peut louer son appartement, faire, etc. Et abusus Tiens, on peut en faire ce qu'on veut, si on a envie de le détruire, de le balancer à la poubelle, de le gaspiller, on peut, on peut le faire. Ben, moi, je crois aujourd'hui qu'un des enjeux, c'est de changer les mentalités, même dans le système du droit et dans les mentalités, sur la notion même de propriété. Et là, c'est la jonction avec la technologie. Et en mettant l'accès, il y a déjà des gens qui parlent de ça, sur l'usage ou la jouissance. Et, et ça, c'est possible. Par exemple, je prends l'exemple d'un parc auto. Hein euh, les gens pensent que lorsqu'ils ont une automobile, alors les mentalités changent, et qu'ils ont le, le, cette espèce de jouissance, mais qui est complètement abstraite, d'avoir leur automobile, à eux, c'est la mienne. Ils la mettent dans leur garage, il faut la se garer, il faut faire ce que... Alors qu'aujourd'hui, via des applications Internet, on pourrait avoir une propriété euh, semi-communautaire, euh, collective, de quartier, d'un parc d'automobiles, qui serait renouvelée plus vite, où on pourrait choisir l'automobile qui nous plaît le plus, mais qui serait utilisé beaucoup plus souvent, avec une plus grande intensité, qui ne resterait pas dans le, dans, dans le garage. Et en fait, tout le monde en jouirait plus, y compris sur le plaisir d'avoir la dernière euh, voiture qu'on ne peut pas se payer si on est en propriété exclusive. Et donc, je pense que la technologie, via le changement des usages, c'est aujourd'hui possible, mais avec une grande réforme juridique et une grande réforme des mentalités, qui ne nous, qui nous réduit pas la jouissance, mais qui, au contraire, la croit. Quoi. Voilà, c'est ça. Je, je suis d'accord, mais c'est une grande réforme des mentalités. Hein. Ah ben oui, mais... 
Je voulais, je voulais revenir un peu sur la question qui concerne l'efficacité. Il y a aussi quelque chose qu'il faut retenir, c'est, comme j'expliquais, pour l'électricité, la demande d'électricité, elle varie en fonction de la journée et de la demande des gens, mais parfois, on ne la prévoit pas suffisamment bien. Et puis, parfois, il y a même, c'est du simple ou double entre l'électricité utilisée à midi et l'électricité utilisée à 8 heures du soir. Et donc, en fait, une, un des éléments, un rêve, qui est de dire, euh, je peux avoir euh, de la production euh, à partir de photovoltaïque et, et d'éolien suffisamment réparti euh, dans des surfaces qui sont très grandes. Et si j'ai une capacité de déplacer les électrons sur de grandes distances, ça voudrait dire que si je peux utiliser aujourd'hui l'électricité qui a été générée euh, en, euh, en Égypte, euh, quand l'Égypte a le soleil et que moi je ne l'ai pas ici, si j'arrive si à avoir par la technologie un moyen de transporter ces électrons sur euh, 3000 km, ça élargit le champ de ce que les euh, énergies euh, renouvelables euh, peuvent atteindre. Et ça, bien sûr, c'est un rêve, mais c'est peut-être pas un rêve complètement... Euh, euh, farfelu parce que euh, l'innovation est là, la recherche est là et en ce moment il y a beaucoup d'argent qui est mis sur la recherche pour euh, ce genre de sujet donc on verra des solutions euh, de ce genre sortir euh, justement donc euh, euh, c'est un peu le, pour revenir sur l'efficacité et donc effectivement avec ce schéma là euh, on utilisera beaucoup mieux et beaucoup plus euh, Nous sommes dans les temps, on a encore le temps pour une question, je vois une... Oui, merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. J'ai une question sur le sujet de la tendance de clean beauty chez les marques comme L'Oréal ou d'autres maquillages. Je voudrais savoir votre opinion sur cette tendance. Ah, alors, euh, je peux vous en parler euh... Clean Beauty, c'est déjà assez vieux chez L'Oréal. Clean Beauty, c'est né d'un... Alors, je parle de L'Oréal, je ne travaille plus chez L'Oréal, je me suis retraité de L'Oréal. Mais je peux vous en parler. Clean Beauty, c'était arrivé il y a une douzaine d'années. On s'est aperçu que sur un certain nombre de matériaux, il y avait une forme de une forme de, de peur de oui de, de, de peur vis-à-vis d'un certain nombre d'ingrédients alors il raisonnait ou il raisonnait euh, parmi les ingrédients il y avait justement des conservateurs de formules parmi ces ingrédients il y avait euh, des ingrédients qui avaient des dénominations chimiques c'est-à-dire on voyait des étoxies des propylènes des machins et et cette notion-là faisait peur aux consommateurs. Donc, on, chez L'Oréal, on s'est dit... Euh, parce qu'il faut comprendre, une, une, une société comme L'Oréal, il y a 9000 matières premières dans le catalogue. Donc, on s'est dit, euh, bon, bah, alors, c'est quelles sont les, les matières premières qui font peur Et donc, on a fait euh, des listes comme ça de matières premières. Et on s'est dit, on va faire de la clean beauty, c'est-à-dire qu'on va développer des produits dans lesquelles ces matières premières qui font peur ne sont pas présentes. Euh, et donc, c'était, euh, disons, une réponse, euh, je dirais, très, très marketing à euh, des consommateurs. Mais il n'y avait pas beaucoup de raisonnement scientifique et technique, parce que chez L'Oréal, il n'y a aucun des, aucune des matières premières qu'on qu utilise qui, qui présente une toxicité euh, humaine humaine. Après, environnementale, on peut discuter euh, parce que c'est bien ça l'enjeu. Et après la clean beauty, on est venu à cette notion de green beauty, où là, on s'est posé la question de, au fond, si on voulait avoir un portefeuille qui soit bio-based, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire et où on en est Alors la bonne nouvelle chez L'Oréal, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, euh, euh, 60% en volume des matières premières qui sont utilisées, sont euh, fabriqués à partir de green chemistry ou biotechnologie, etc. 
Donc, euh, on est assez bien placé chez L'Oréal. Euh, D'ailleurs, euh, je parle de L'Oréal, mais euh, la plupart des grands groupes de cosmétiques sont à un bon niveau. Maintenant, l'enjeu, euh, et ça, c'est à mes suivants de, de faire le, le boulot, mais l'enjeu, il va au-delà de green chemistry ou bio-based chemistry. L'enjeu, c'est aussi, quand je jette un, une bouteille de shampoing plastique à la mer, euh, qu'elle soit L'Oréal, ou et si elle est en polyéthylène ou en, en polypropylène, ou, au fond, je jette un matériau qui n'est pas dégradable. Donc je pollue. Et d'ailleurs, ce n'est pas inerte, hein, parce que ma bouteille, elle va finir par se casser en petits morceaux, je vais faire des nanoplastiques, etc. Bon, le sixième continent, vous connaissez l'histoire. Donc l'enjeu pour euh, des compagnies comme L'Oréal, mais en gros pour toute la grande consommation, c'est de se mettre à utiliser des matériaux qui non so seulement sont obtenus par des voies qui n'induisent pas la, la formation de, de gaz à effet de serre, mais qui en plus sont dégradables pour justement participer à, euh, au recyclage, euh, à tout ce qui est euh, renewal, etc. Et ça, il y a des programmes qui sont en cours aujourd'hui, euh, mais qui posent des grandes questions, parce qu'un euh, un polymère biodégradable pour faire un plastique, ça coûte beaucoup plus cher qu'un polypropylène. Merci beaucoup pour votre éclairage. Peut-être un, un mot de la fin avant de conclure votre intervention sur les acteurs de cette transition énergétique. Quelle est votre perspective sur le sujet Donc, Comme je vous l'ai dit, la situation actuelle, c'est ce que je vous ai présenté un peu. Donc il y a un problème de taille, un problème de, de volume. Pour pouvoir euh, arriver vers les solutions, il faut vraiment que ce soit toute la chaîne qui soit impliquée. C'est-à-dire, on a la COP28 qui définit les grandes lignes pour chacun des pays, où les pays s'engagent. Et ça, c'est très important parce que, d'une certaine manière, ça permet à peu près d'avoir un langage commun au niveau des, des, des Nations Unies. Mais il n'y a pas de réalisation derrière ça. C'est des principes. Quand on descend au niveau et dessous, on se retrouve avec les États. Et là, les États, ils ont des capacités réelles. Euh, surtout les, les, les États qui disposent euh, de ressources rares, euh, qui sont euh, les hommes, et donc les universités, euh, et euh, de l'argent pour pouvoir justement financer. Et il est certain que si aujourd'hui chacun des pays décidait déjà de commencer par faire un statut des émissions de gaz à effet de serre dans son pays, d'où ça vient qu'il essaie de se définir lui-même un projet de comment est-ce qu'il veut le pays dans 20 ans, dans 30 ans. Qu'il voit ce qu'en tant qu'État, on peut faire pour arriver vers cet État. Et l'État a des choses très importantes. Par exemple, tout ce qu'il achète. Il peut commencer à dire, à partir de maintenant, je, je n'achète que dans des compagnies pour lesquelles le scope 1 et le scope 2, euh, il y a moins de CO2. Euh, après, l'État aussi, c'est celui qui a les infrastructures. Donc, il peut développer les infrastructures pour faciliter l'émergence de ces nouvelles énergies. Parce qu'il faudra beaucoup de temps, beaucoup d'argent, mais l'État a quelque chose d'important à faire. Et bien entendu, après, il y a toute la réglementation, il faut qu'il vérifie si ça marche. Au-dessous de l'État, il y a aussi des acteurs que je trouve qui sont très importants et qu'on verra, je pense, de plus en plus, ce sont les, les maires des grandes villes. Parce que euh, le, le responsable d'une grande ville, lui, c'est tous les jours qu'il voit les problèmes liés aux émissions de, de CO2. Et on a vu de plus en plus euh, des associations des maires des grandes villes. Donc vous pouvez avoir Casablanca, euh, Kinshasa, euh, New York, euh, Los Angeles, et, et, et tous entre eux, il y a un travail qui commence à être fait euh, et qui, ils échangent les bonnes idées. Euh, J'ai oublié Singapour, parce que Singapour, eux, avec le réchauffement climatique, ils ont des problèmes plus importants que d'autres régions du monde. Mais ils commencent à avoir des idées sur, euh, euh, bon, bien sûr, euh, passer à la mobilité différente, euh, mettre plus d'arbres. Ça, j'y crois beaucoup, que c'est des choses que l'on va voir venir. Bon, et si je descends à la fin, euh, c'est chacun d'entre nous. Euh, C'est-à-dire, euh, bon... Euh, Parmi les émissions de gaz à effet de serre que je fais, 
euh, déjà, il faut que chacun d'entre nous fasse son calcul. Il sache qu'est-ce que je consomme comme électricité, ça correspond à quoi. Euh, quand on est dans des pays comme moi à Paris, euh, j'utilise le gaz pour me chauffer, donc c'est beaucoup de CO2. Euh, j'utilise pas beaucoup ma voiture, donc ça, il n'y a pas de problème. Mais par contre, j'utilise l'avion. Ça vaut la peine de, de faire le calcul personnel, euh, sachant que la moyenne, c'est 5 tonnes euh, d'émissions de, de CO2 par personne par an. Si on prend la population mondiale, euh, est-ce que je suis au-dessus de ces 5 euh, Les Américains sont à 15, euh, les Marocains sont à 2 euh, au Maroc. Donc, euh, est-ce que moi, euh, je suis plutôt à 3 ou est-ce que je suis à 5 Donc, voilà ce que je voulais dire. C'est les acteurs, c'est tout le monde, c'est nous tous. Et c'est chacun à son niveau, avec euh, les, les, là où il peut agir, euh, qu'on doit pouvoir euh, avancer vers une solution. Et, et je, je rappelle ce que je disais, je crois beaucoup euh, à l'association des, des maires des grandes villes. Merci infiniment, messieurs, pour vos interventions. Merci pour votre partage d'expérience et d'expertise. Nous les accompagnons, mesdames et messieurs, sous vos applaudissements, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup. Ladies and gentlemen, what an exciting start to Science Week. We've delved today in a fascinating topics. We went from mind to crystals, to climate change, to energy transition. We've had an incredible lineup of speakers. Tomorrow we will kick off the day with artificial intelligence and we will hear from Moroccans at the forefront of AI in the world. This is a very much awaited session. We will talk about aliens. Uh, is it a, a fantasy or the future of humanity? And we will have the chance to attend a groundbreaking world premiere screening of Alter Ego, which is about cloning. So it's movie night tonight. Make sure you all come and bring on your friends. Make sure you do not miss out on tomorrow evening and uh, set an alarm to join us bright and early tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. sharp. Okay, 9 a.m. sharp, tomorrow morning, set your alarms, we'll be here waiting for you for an amazing, amazing day. I hope you've all enjoyed the day as much as I did. Uh, we would greatly appreciate if you take just a quick moment to qu uh, complete a quick survey. I guess the team will put up a QR code for you. Your feedback is really important as we want to improve this and really make it centered around you. So take a quick second to um, respond to the survey and it's also available on, on the app. Finally, I wanted to share a final item. As you leave the venue, you will pass by a wall of messages. We would love to have a message from you and, you know, just keep a memory of this uh, start of Science Week. That is it for today. Have a fantastic evening. I'll see you all tomorrow morning, bright and early. Thank you.